We're going to start in about four minutes and 47 seconds. So synchronize your watches and we'll get going. Good morning. Uh, welcome to day three. This is it, our swan song. Lots of bonding going on at the meeting, people getting to know one another, right? Oh, you're at the meeting, aren't you? Yes, good. Well, that's great. That's also one of the key parts of having this meeting. Another thing that we tried desperately to fight and couldn't win was trying to figure out a way to create some collective purchasing power where we'd all donate, have a fund, and buy coffee that could be available without having to go down to the downstairs of the marketplace and then we'll work on it, we're working on it. But in exchange for no coffee, we start at nine o'clock. That's kind of civilized, so there, there we go, yay. Um, okay, here we go. So a couple of uh, moderator things today. The webcasts from yesterday and uh, Monday are up on the ISUSA website. Um, 
and today's will be up tomorrow, so if you can follow all that, it'll all be up <clears throat> by Thursday, so that's great. Um, as I'll talk about in a second, one of the key things of this meeting is that you guys are representative of your entire clinic. And so the idea is for you to go back and take um, notes and then make presentations in probably informal ways, however you want to do it, so that the uh, group that you're working with um, can learn from this as well. Uh, key slides are available to you on the website. You can download those and use them ad lib any way you want. And so that's something, uh, and also you, if there's a particular talk or event that you wanted to uh, reference, you could uh, go to the webcast and just show that part if you wanted to make it part of your presentation. The evaluation forms have created a little bit of confusion. Um, I think that's kind of our fault. Um, every day you can evaluate, but here's the trick. You can't just kind of start and stop, because if you do, it won't be saved. If you start only partially complete and save or submit, you can't go back and do it. So the thing is, at the end of the day, or if you haven't done it for the first two days, now's a good time or sometime today, go into each day, rank uh, each session, including the workshops, and then once you have them all um, filled out, then hit submit and then move to the next day. Pretty straightforward. Um, for the nursing and CME credit and pharmacy credits, uh, the certificate of participation uh, must be completed by Friday, September 29th, so you got over a month. Bottom line is if you don't do it this week, you'll probably forget about it, so why don't you just do it today and get it done with? kind of the best way to do that. And uh, that also includes your MOC points. So a lot of the speakers have been pretty good about telling you what's on that test. So when you took the pretest and now you got the post, I mean, it's, it's better than medical school uh, or nursing school or pharmacy school. Once you complete your overall evaluation, you'll be taken to the e-form so you can um, uh, get your credits. So I already mentioned this. Um, the key slides are available, the webcasts and podcasts are available, there's also suggested reading. So go back and um, be the mover and shaker at your clinic for the uh, dissemination of information. All right, here we go. This is our one and only ARS question for me today, uh, and I will provide my own music, thank you very much. Um, so here's your question. Of the following, which topic are you most enthusiastic to share first with your clinical team. So let's go ahead and transition to the poll. We'll look for the little number, <coughs> not up yet. All right, here we go. How does a bastard, orphan, son of a whore and a Scotsman dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean, in providence impoverished and squalor, grow up to be a hero and a scholar. The $10 founding father without a father got a lot farther by working a lot harder by being a self-starter. At 14, they put him in charge of the trading charter. Anybody know where that's from? Hi. Right. <laughs> Hamilton, okay, whoops. How come that didn't go, let's see. All right, so most people found um, antiretroviral therapy uh, to be the most compelling, but it's kind of cool because it's, it's a good spread. So that's the beauty of this. You get to decide and present as much or as little um, as you feel is, is good for your group. And we have more topics today, obviously. A reminder for the Q&A, microphones there and there, and then the cue cards. Uh, if you're on the webcast, um, just send it and we'll look it up on the iPad. So uh, today's workshops have not changed, so what, what's printed in your program is accurate. Uh, these are the, we have the national curriculum with David Spock again. Um, we have the opioids and beyond opioids in the Blanco room, uh, managing chronic pain uh, in the pecan room, or, yeah, that's it. And uh, peri-pregnancy issues in the oak room, and then mental health and, um, what is that? Liano, Lano. Yeah, you can read it. Good. Okay, 
we're ready to go. Our first speaker this morning is Dr. Sue Swindells, who has been a stalwart in the epidemic in terms of doing great research over many years, especially in regard to the ACTG. In the last several years, she's turned her attention uh, more and more towards tuberculosis, and especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. So you name the country, she's been there and been participating, mostly through ACTG trials, and then it also includes South America. So we've asked Sue to come in and tell us about what's new in tuberculosis, kind of the age-old uh, Shakespearean question, TB or not TB? That is the question. Please. She can't make it up the stairs. That's right? such a terrible joke. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> there. So it's gone off without leaving me any instructions. I guess this is how I advance the slides, right? Okay, thank you. Laura's paying attention. So um, I'm very delighted to be here. Unfortunately, I couldn't come till last night for, for many boring reasons, but I've heard it's been an excellent conference, and I hope you've all enjoyed it. And I'm very pleased to be able to talk a little bit about TB today, uh, my disclosures, nothing very exciting, uh, learning objectives, which I won't read. And then um, first content slide. So we don't think a lot about TB in the US anymore because we really don't have an awful lot of it. It's not a huge priority. Most of us who don't live on one of the coasts don't see a lot in our clinics. But in the world in general, it's an enormous problem still. And so this is a slide showing the incidence by color in um, most countries in the world. And as you can see, in the US, we're in a, a low, low incidence area, but sub-Saharan Africa has enormous problems. And so in terms of TB infection rather than disease, 23% of the world's population is infected with TB. Now, this number used to be a third. We kept going. I've been saying it for years, a third. But actually, it's not a third. This is the correct number, because some clever people in Europe did some science and actually worked out. It's 23%, uh, but it's a lot. And so the WHO reports, the most recent full report is 2015. There were 10 million new cases of TB disease, of whom uh, 1.2 million were co-infected with HIV. And there were 1.4 million deaths of which um, 400,000 were co-infected, which is more than 1,000 people a day. And that's still going on. Unfortunately, uh, we haven't really made much dent in the TB epidemic over the, the last few years for uh, many and complicated reasons. So this is my first leading up to an ARS question. This is a case of a patient who comes to your clinic, 35-year-old man originally from Mexico. He was diagnosed about, with HIV about six months ago when he was in the hospital with community-acquired pneumonia. He got started on a combination TAF-FTC L-Vitegravir cobicistat. His, his CD4 has gone up some, not fantastic, but it's going the right direction. His virus load is undetectable. And you decide you should test him for latent TB. And you use um, an interferon gamma release assay, in this case the quantiferon. And you get a result back that says indeterminate. And I think many of you in this room have probably had this experience. And so here's the question about what you should do. So what do I have to do now to get the ARS thing? Just wait? Nothing? Nothing, right, for a minute? OK. Thank you. OK, so um, I've given this talk a few times, or versions of it, and I get the same response. Oftentimes, there are more people who think that this should be treated for a uh, sort of positive, which I would say would be um, 
not the correct answer. TB skin testing is an option, but with a CD4 count of 100, you may not get a response to that either. So um, my advice, although this is not set in stone, would be to wait until his CD4 count is higher and then repeat the quantifieron. And I'll explain in just a second why I think that is. If you keep doing it, which is the tendency, especially like for the trainees, you know, the fellows and the residents, they just keep repeating a test till they get the result they want. But uh, you'll, you'll get, you'll, you know, you'll get an indeterminate and then a negative and then a low positive and then you just like, well, I don't know what to do with this. So uh, I think waiting is better. So briefly, as I'm sure you all know, risk of development of disease in infected persons who have HIV is much higher than in the general population. Uh, most people um, uh, you know, have a lifetime risk of about 10%, and in, if you have HIV, it's 10% per year. So it's like enormously uh, increased in terms of your risk. These are the CDC recommendations for testing for latent TB infection. Uh, initially after diagnosis and then annually. Uh, some of us in low prevalence areas don't necessarily do this because it's not a very high yield, but that's what the CDC recommend. Um, if this patient's not on antiviral therapy, wait until they are. So part of the problem is there really is no good test for this. And so uh, there's no good test for TB infection, and the tests for TB disease aren't great either. And so, um, that makes me think about how lucky we are in HIV, because the diagnostic test for HIV is so good. It's like easy to do, it's incredibly reliable, um, it's hardly ever wrong, and uh, you can even do a, a test for you know how far people are in their disease and monitor them for response to therapy. And so, uh, just be glad that we have such a good HIV test and a virus load because in, in TB world, they've got none of this and they're actually quite jealous of us because we have that, not to mention better drugs. So, um, neither of the tests, that's TB skin test or the interferon gamma release assay predict progression to active disease. You can't use them for monitoring response to therapy. If either test is positive, there's no benefit to repeating it. And there is no role for these tests in diagnosis of active TB. If you have a patient you suspect has active TB, don't use these tests. They don't have good predictive value in either direction, positive or negative. But I see them done a lot because it's an easy thing to do. and. Um, uh, it's often done, but not helpful. So these are the two tests on the left. Am I left? Yes. Is the TB skin test, which as you know, is an in injection under the skin to induce uh, delayed type hypersensitivity response. You can actually read this two to seven days later. In every guideline you read, it says, um, 72 hours or three days, that's based on absolutely no science whatsoever, and up to seven days is perfectly fine. Uh, you have to measure in duration, not erythema, which is a little bit tricky. And I use a ballpoint pen as is as in, in, illustrated in this slide. And um, that's something that not everyone quite gets and knows how to do, so there's a bit of training involved. On the other hand, the blood test is easy. You just fill the tubes. It's quite a bit of blood. And there's some issues with the handling of it, but the, either of the tests that are shown here, which are the two FDA-approved tests in the US, are perfectly fine. There's nothing to choose between either one, so it doesn't matter which one your, your lab uses. OK, so um, in this same case, this patient, you wait six months. He's been on medicine, doing, uh, doing well. CD4 count is now 300. You repeat the IGRA, and it's positive. And he has no signs or symptoms of active TB, no fever, night sweats, weight loss, cough. His chest x-ray is completely normal. And so you think you want to treat him for latent infection. How should you treat? his latent TB? What is the best option for someone co-infected with HIV and on the medicine that he's on?
Excellent. So yeah, pretty much everyone got it right. So uh, these are the um, CDC recommended regimens for treatment of LTBI in people with HIV. Uh, INH for nine months. Uh, this new, relatively new <laughs> weekly INH and rifapentin regimen for only 12 weeks, which is very nice because 12 weeks is much simpler and once a week is simpler. And then there are two rifamycin-based regimens that you can take daily for four months. But you have to be very careful with rifamycins in people with HIV and uh, who are on other medicines. So um, as you know, in uh, our work dealing with people on antiretroviral therapy, there are multiple problems with drug interactions. We always have to be looking up, does this new antipsychotic or drug for cholesterol or something interact with antiretroviral therapy? And there's different ways they can do this, and it turns out that the rifamycins use every single possible mechanism for creating a drug interaction. And so they in induce a gene expression, they induce metabolizing enzymes, they impact these PGP things that get things in and out of cells. So every possible mechanism for creating an interaction, they, they do, and it leads to um, uh, sometimes dramatic but uh, often confusing interactions with almost anything else you give them with. And so the, the short answer is that you can use any antiretroviral regimen with um, isoniazid alone, even though nine months is hard, and I don't know about the rest of you, but in our clinic we have a hard time keeping people going for the whole nine months. Um, but if you're using this weekly isoniazid and rifapentin regimen, you could only use it with someone on efavirenz, which is increasingly sort of uncommon these days, or some people are still on it, or a raltegravir-based regimen. And those are the only two that we have any data on to support co-administration. And just note for the nucleoside portion that TAF, tenofovir um, alafenamide is contraindicated with all rifamycins. And I'll explain why in a second, but that's kind of a nuisance too. So you have to be very careful. If you're using the rif rifampin regimen, you can use efavirenz or dolutegravir if you double the dose. And if you're using the rifibutin regimen, which is rarely used for LTBI, you can use that with a PI. So as I say, this is complicated. At the bottom of the slide are a couple of resources. There's a drug interaction app, and then also the HHS guidelines, which has very nice interaction tables. So uh, why is it important to offer people treatment for their LTBI? Well, the short answer is it's pretty good in people that have HIV. This is a meta-analysis by the Cochrane Group of uh, very many patients in very many randomized clinical trials who had HIV infection and were given isoniazid preventive therapy. And as you can see, the overall reduction in TB was uh, act development of active disease was 36% and more so if they had evidence of infection by a positive skin test. So it's not fantastic, it's not a complete home run, but it's a really pretty good option and for now the best one that we have to try to prevent infected people going on to develop active TB disease. Some more recent data from a large study done on the Ivory Coast in Cote d'Ivoire looked at the impact of adding IPT um, to early or deferred antiretroviral therapy. So this was a 2,000 patient study. With, they had less than 800 CD4 cells. They got randomized to either immediate or deferred antiviral therapy, plus or minus IPT, or isoniazid preventive therapy. And it turns out that both antiretroviral therapy and IPT decreased risk of TB independently. So aside from using IPT, actually early initiation of antiretroviral therapy, which we're all trying to do these days, is also helpful in prevention of TB. So in our second case, we have a 54-year-old woman admitted to the hospital with cough, fever, and weight loss. She's diagnosed with HIV-1 admission, CD4 counts only 70, virus loads 120,000. Chest X-ray looks suspicious for TB with pleural thickening and a diffuse infiltrate. 
and, uh, but her sputum AFB is negative, and she undergoes bronchoscopy for pneumocystis, and that's negative too. So uh, the question is about how to diagnose active TB these days. So on the left, we have a light microscope, which has been the staple of TB diagnostics for centuries and still is in many parts of the world. So you stain a, a sputum on a slide with uh, oramine stain or zeal nilsen and look for little red snappers, little, um, they stain red, uh, TB germs. And uh, it's, it works reasonably well, but it's not a great test. But we now have rapid molecular diagnostics which work much better and are much simpler and have really changed the landscape in terms of TB diagnostics globally. And the first game changer was the expert MTB RIF assay. And it's really pretty simple. You put the sputum in the little cartridge and you put it in the machine and four hours later you get a result. TB, yes, no. Also, rifampin resistance, yes, no, which is very helpful. And so these are very easy to do. I always think it's about the same as, you know, I don't know if you guys have been to Europe or some place where they have like a complicated coffee making machine in your hotel room. And it's about like that, you know, you put the cartridge in and then you've got to push a few buttons and that's it. So this works great. I mean, it does require, you know, electricity and, um, uh, a supply of cartridges and a way to dispose of them and some issues which are difficult in some settings, but mostly it's terrific. It works in children, it works in extrapulmonary TB. They're coming out with Expert Ultra, which does even more, so this is all good. There's also um, a genotype test that takes about five hours, but this gives you rifampin and isoniazid resistance, so this is also very helpful, but a little bit more complicated to administer. So many of you may have these gene expert machines at your hospitals that you can now use to diagnose TB. And one of the great benefits of this is um, often the, the most useful um, aspect of these tests is to rule out TB. Because as you know, when someone goes in the hospital with suspected TB, they have to go in a special isolation room and you've got to put all the stuff on to go in there. And uh, it's, it's just the patients hate it and it's annoying for the staff. And, and so some studies to show they get less attention because they're in this isolation. So this is an ACTG study that we did a couple of years ago looking at the sensitivity and specificity of this expert test in people with and without HIV infection. And this was also done at multiple US sites as well as sites in um, Africa and Brazil and elsewhere. And as you can see, the sensitivity is really pretty good. If they're smear positive, they're, it's 100% sensitive, 61% otherwise, which is better than a smear test, an AFB smear test. but. The, the best part is the specificity. So this is ruling out TB. And as you can see, the numbers are terrific. So if you get someone with this expert test, you get a decent sputum specimen, it's negative, they don't have TB and they can come out of isolation. And um, that's actually been endorsed by uh, FDA and CDC guidelines saying that you can take a patient out of isolation. There's a small incremental yield from doing two expert tests, but I personally think one is plenty, but it may need two to persuade your infection control people that that's actually enough. But this is a handy test to have. So the patient in our case is diagnosed with uh, TB by this expert RIF, started on treatment with the standard four drug regimen. If you remember her CD4 count 70, she's naive to antiretroviral therapy. So after starting TB treatment, when should you start antiretroviral therapy is the question. And these are the possible responses. Good. Okay, yes, I like that. So um, every, pretty much everyone agrees starting antiretroviral therapy soon is good. 
Uh, some would prefer to wait a little while, and uh, pretty much nobody thinks that we should wait till the end of TB treatment, which used to be the default um, uh, practice that we did. And so the rationale for starting early is based on three large randomized clinical trials, all addressing the same question of when to start antiviral therapy in co-infected patients with TB. And these are the three trials. And this is a summary of the results, and all of them showing uh, benefit to initiating antiretroviral therapy um, earlier, and particularly with people with low CD4 counts. So it used to be that we would you know, worry about starting antiviral therapy and TB therapy, because it was like too much medicine, and would people be able to take it all, and there was potential for overlapping toxicities, drug interactions, iris, all of these things. So as you know, as our antiviral therapy has got simpler, this issue of people taking a bucket full of pills, you know, that's pretty much gone away. Um, the toxicities are minimal, really, with antiviral therapy. Um, drug interactions is a problem, iris also, but those are, um, I would argue, manageable. So now all of the major guidelines organization uh, recommend starting our antiviral therapy within two weeks for people with a low CD4 count and within eight weeks for those with a little bit higher. The exception is TB meningitis, which we rarely see, but this is a similar situation to cryptococcal meningitis, where starting early can cause cerebral edema and um, bad things can happen. So what are the options for co-treatment of um, people with uh, HIV and TB who are on a traditional TB regimen. And so I don't expect you guys to remember this, but this is in the, the um, resource, resources that I mentioned. It's in all of the treatment guidelines. And these are basically your options. If you're using rifampin, you can use efavirenz. You can use uh, boosted PIs with rifibutin. You can use raltegravir at twice the dose. Um, or 800 milligrams uh, twice daily for um, rifampin, and you can use dolutegravir twice the dose too to overcome the interaction. So there are relatively limited options, but there are options. So why can't we use TAF is the question. All of the package inserts say contraindicated with all rifamycins. This, it turns out, is based on modeling data, and they used carbamazepine as a, as a probe drug in the development of TAF, and showed that if you gave those together, the TAF exposure was decreased by half, which is a problem, because half is a lot. And it turns out that TAF is different in this regard than the uh, disoproxyl fumarate version, oops, of tenofovir, um, in that it's um, more influenced by these PGPs. So it's pharmacologically just different enough from the regular tenofovir, as it were, that we shouldn't use it. So we need to do actual interaction studies in humans, and those are planned. So a lot of times, particularly in the US, I see rifibutin used for TB treatment. And because there's a lot less interactions with it, and you could use it with a boosted PI and other drugs. But I'm not a huge fan. And these are the reasons why we don't have a lot of data in co-infected patients to show that it's really efficacious in treatment of TB. We're not exactly sure of the dose. Most of the dosing guidelines are based on interaction studies in healthy volunteers. And there's quite a bit of evidence that healthy volunteers and people with HIV and people with HIV and TB particularly are not the same in the way they metabolize drugs for various reasons. This risk of uveitis with rifibutin is actually a real problem, and you keep having to send them to the eye doctor, and then if they get it, it um, really can, can be quite bad. Uh, it's expensive, and if those of you who treat children, you can't. So uh, you can use it, but uh, just bear in mind those caveats. And the other thing I wanted to mention is the package insert for Sostiva specifically, and I know you're not supposed to say brand names at these conferences, but I have to because it's actually only this is the only Favarin's formulation that has this in the package insert. So the co-formulated products with Favarin's don't say anything about this. But just Favarin's says that if you have a patient who weighs 50 kilos or more, you have to increase the dose. And this, I would also argue, was, is wrong and that you should ignore it. 
And the reason is, <laughs> no, well, uh, we've had arguments with the FDA and they, they know um, our feelings. That, that again was based on healthy volunteers, you know, white men in Baltimore or somewhere. And so, uh, if, but studying the, the impact of co-administration in actual patients who have both HIV and TB, paradoxically, the favorin's exposure goes up not down, so you don't have to increase the dose. In fact, it would be a bad idea. And so this is one trial that supports that, and there are others too. So use regular dose efavirenz with rifampin. Okay, so I missed the number in here, but our patient with TB starts antiretroviral therapy after two weeks, as most people recommended. 10 days later, things are not going well. She, her fever comes back, she's more dyspneic, her cough is worse. Uh, chest x-ray shows progression of the pulmonary infiltrates that we saw at the beginning. And so you suspect that she has iris. What to do? So you, you want to make sure that she doesn't have drug-resistant TB. You want to make sure you're not missing some other kind of pulmonary process. But assuming this is TB iris, what is the best? management strategy. Okay, so pretty much all of you would give up prednisone. Uh, hardly anyone would stop antiviral therapy. I agree with not stopping antiviral therapy. Uh, I think we should hardly ever stop it unless we absolutely have to. I think the default is always to just be brave and, and carry on and hope that things will get better. Uh, NSAIDs, a few people like that, and some people like the just be brave and carry on and hope things get better approach, which often works, actually. So um, what are the data on use of prednisone? It turns out not great. Um, so here are some, some thoughts about uh, iris. It's more common if you start antiviral therapy earlier. There's data to that more common with a low CD4 count, but rarely severe or fatal. Occasionally it is. It's really more of a nuisance. You know, you're just not sure if people are not responding to treatment because they're on the wrong treatment, or is this iris? You know, it really is confusing in any kind of opportunistic infection, I think. And so trying to, uh, because there's no diagnostic test for iris, then you've got to diagnose it by exclusion, rule out everything else. And, um, but the quality of evidence for either non-steroidals or prednisone is not great. And it's partly because it's difficult to study this. It's complicated how to measure iris and how to measure iris getting better, which it sort of does anyway, even if you don't do anything. So um, the, the process is difficult. But there has been one uh, published randomized trial of using prednisone. Actually, this was in hospitalized patients, which showed it was effective. And so that's certainly a consideration. This same author, Graham Manches from South Africa, actually presented at Croy also of a um, preventive study looking at whether prednisone prevents iris. And in his study, it did. But this was a relatively small study. And it's only one. And I think most people aren't adopting preventive prednisone. So Laura told me that yesterday there was a question about this for um, either a real or theoretical patient with a very high virus load and low CD4 count who had TB and uh, needed treatment for HIV too, uh, HIV as well. And you know, when should you start antiviral therapy? And I would recommend that you do follow the guidelines, start early, but be watchful for iris and then um, if necessary, uh, prednisone is probably going to be effective in terms of uh, reducing the, the signs and symptoms. So that would be my recommendation, is just to follow the guidelines and start even though you know this is possibly going to happen. So in summary, as I mentioned, we have no virus load test for TB. We really don't have great uh, diagnostic tests for either infection or disease, but there's some improvement. 
We uh, are working in the world of TB, HIV co-infection to try to shorten TB treatment. You know, right now it's six months at least if, that's, if they have drug-sensitive TB and much longer if they don't, which is a really long time to do it. And so there have been some treatment shortening studies, as I didn't show you, that unfortunately were not successful. And so we haven't um, succeeded there yet. Uh, we have a great need for better treatment for children, which is a big problem in um, both HIV world and TB world. So this, this slide shows the global TB drug pipeline. I know you had a talk yesterday, I think, or the day before about uh, HIV drugs in the pipeline, which looks very robust. This, I think, not so much. but. Uh, and some of the drugs really aren't that exciting, but there are a couple of new drugs that have been approved. This bedaquilin is a drug that works for drug-resistant TB, and that's approved for use in the US. And there's another one called delaminid, which is going to be approved in the US too. So we do at least have two halfway decent drugs for drug-resistant TB, which have improved greatly the treatment for that, and they actually work for even this extensively drug-resistant TB. But not a lot of really exciting drugs. This isn't an area of importance for pharma. There's really no money in it, and so it's difficult to get them excited. So in summary, the uh, uh, take-home message is, is that you can prevent TB by treating the HIV or latent infection in those who have it. We do have improvement in diagnostics, but the new drug pipeline is pretty thin and not too excited. It's exciting. Um, we should treat HIV and TB together. Be careful about drug interactions, but you can come up with safe and effective regimens. And one of the things that I, I sort of miss working in TB world is we have no real advocacy. You know, there's no community we can go to. We don't have treatment action group people that we can call on to put pressure on the drug companies. We, they do a little bit. They do have some interest in TB, but nothing like uh, in the world of HIV, where the uh, community and the activists have been so incredibly helpful. And so that's greatly needed. OK. So wait here. Or? OK. So, to finish my introduction, whether tis nobler to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous sovereigns, and then perhaps perchance to dream, right? So you can, you can dream with 800 milligrams, you can get a lot of dreaming done. Yeah. yeah. All right. If we use- Have you been doing this all week? No, just today. <laughs> If we use prednisone for iris, um, do we need to extend the TB treatment while on prednisone? That's a great question, and short answer is no. So uh, there's no evidence that, that the prednisone is really going to impact the uh, antibacterial um, effect of the TB treatment. So the TB treatment should just go for the same period as you would before. Okay. Um, the five millimeter TST, the skin test, yeah. is that considered positive for HIV people, persons, regardless of their immune status? Yes. Okay, so even yeah. somebody who's kind of normal and has yes. a, yeah. Okay. Yes, I have, I have HIV. I mean, again, it's, you know, it's, um, it is what it is. Not a great test, but yes. Yeah. What about dolutegravir with rifabutin? I don't think that's been, to my knowledge, no, it has been studied. Yeah, that's OK. Yes. Yeah, it's, I mean, raltegravir is probably a little bit better in well, terms just of. Just we have more data. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. But yes, you can use. Um, I honestly don't have it in my head if it has to be twice daily dosing, but that would be easy to find out, probably. OK. In the areas where there's high TB prevalence, um, any indication of repeating IPT in patients on art and doing That's well? That's another great question. Should you repeat the IPT in places where, um, you know, because th there's pretty good data that you take it for. If in, in rest of the world, the, the, the WHO IPT regimen is six months. Ours is nine months. It's all just a bit arbitrary. But um, after six months of treatment, 
the protective effect of the IPT actually disappears relatively quickly. So if you live in the Eastern Cape in South Africa, where they, you know, they have a huge TB burden, and um, get on a bus and someone coughs on you, you know, you can be exposed and reinfected. So there's actually a study going on looking at should you do this annually or you know cyclically in some way to keep uh, giving people the benefit of the protective therapy. And I know, uh, this is a, a stupid story, but um, they have quite a bit of TB in Russia. And so what rich Russian people do is go to their doctors in winter and request isoniazid to just protect them from being coughed on by the peasants, you know, through the winter. It's quite fashionable to do that, turns out, every winter. So, anyway. Wow, well, I, I just thought they were busy on the internet. Uh, microphone. <laughs> Peer reviews. Um, I discovered the PA in Denton, a small area kind of next to Dallas, that um, she was treating, I mean, she was seeing a lot of TB Golds positive, and so she would do the skin test then in those and, and not treat them if that was negative. And I said, I don't think that's right, yeah. but, yeah. but that's, then I had shortly after that an episode of 11 TB conversions in a population of about 200, and I thought, do I have an active TB? And in investigating that, I found that in a healthcare associated setting, there was a batch of the TB gold tubes that were um, faulty and right. giving a lot of false positives. And right. so I don't know how pervasive that problem is, but I had the problem in Sherman and she had the problem in Denton. Yeah, no, it happened. I treated all of mine, but I'm not sure that was correct either. So, you know, I thought I had a slide on the IGRA performance thing, but somehow I must have whizzed over it or it fell out or something. But. Anyway, um, part of the issue with these interferon gamma release assays is that you know, everyone thinks they're easy, you just fill the tubes, but actually they have to be processed uh, in a relatively short period of time and they have to be kept at a certain temperature. And so, you know, if you're in a clinic where you're using a courier to transport them somewhere else and they sit around or get lost on the specimen receiving desk or something, there can be problems with them. So it's actually not quite all that simple. The new one that they're coming out with um, is going to be a little better in that regard. So you will get uh, results that are wrong. It's usually due to this specimen handling problem. So the other question about if you have someone who has a positive IGRA test, um, should you use a TB skin test to decide whether or not to treatment? This is people without HIV, right? This is healthcare workers or something. HIV clinics. Okay. Hmm? okay. So the only thing I can point you to is the ATS, the American Thoracic Society Guidelines, Society Guidelines say that if you have someone at low risk for TB who has a positive interferon gamma release assay, do a TB skin test and treat them only if both are positive. That's what the ATS guidelines say. But they also say this is based on basically no evidence. This is just the opinion of the experts there. And it is, it, it is relatively sensible advice, I think. But the problem is when someone has HIV is that they're not at low risk. And so I don't think that equation applies in this setting. So for a healthcare worker who didn't have HIV, maybe. Uh, but for people with HIV, if they've got a positive IGRA, I think they, that's an indication for treatment. Okay, a couple questions, actually several, just about the T-spot and uh, what if there are less um, intermediate results? Are they be is that better than quantiferon? Uh, no. No. no difference between T-spot and quantiferon in terms of performance. Doesn't then, make, they're both as good and bad as each other. Can you look at the slides again, or is that too complicated? If I'm trying to see if that slide's in there, no? We can look while we're looking. Slide sort of thing? Um, I could have sworn it was, but. If someone is treated while we're looking, if someone's treated for TB, can they get disease again? They're cured and oh, then yes. relapse? Yes. Yeah. Uh, people can get uh, TB multiple times, and. Um, <coughs> 
It can be either a relapse or reinfection, and, and uh, either is possible, and they're quite hard to sort out, to be honest, and it requires whole genome sequencing of the isolate that they had uh, to begin with, and then the one that they have with the second episode, and that's not readily available outside a research context, so often you're not even sure if it was a new um, infection or that the TB relapse, hard to sort out. Right. Is that the slide you're no. looking for? No. It's be go backwards a bit more. No. Well, I think it might have been it. No? Yep. I don't know. Must have f fallen out. Okay. Anyway, okay. we mentioned the specimen handling It's issue. like your life so flashing before your eyes. It's a scary right. thing. So if somebody has a history of TB enteritis, they get treated. How would you follow them over time? Repeat Lord. serial chest x-rays? You can't. Enteritis? Uh, pardon? Enteritis, you enteritis, said? Enteritis, gut. Yeah, yeah, like they drink goat's milk that was infected or something. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Dude. Yeah? No. Don't I can't, know. No, I, I mean, uh, you could look at how that was diagnosed, but I mean, if they had no pulmonary disease, then chest x-rays aren't going to help you. So that's another part of the problem is, you know, we don't have a good um, test to monitor response to therapy and um, whether or not people are cured, particularly in the context of extra pulmonary disease. So uh, pulmonary disease. Okay. 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 Um, I don't think it's in there, Kristen. May not I be. don't know what happened to it. Just poof, gone. Vanished into the ethers. Yep. Is so, somebody? Go ahead. Um, no, there's you know, there's the person, really yeah. no. I don't think there's any good test. Um, I mean, presumably this. I, this Here, is a real case. Was based on a biopsy of something. Or? So here's a little clinical pearl. If you want to really uh, just wow people on rounds or something. If somebody has um, TB enteritis, uh, a physical sign is an omental rub. So if you're listening and you hear with peristalsis a rub, that's TB till proven otherwise, for whatever that's worth. For all the cases that you see of that in your lifetime. Yeah. And how so then you, when they get better, the rub goes away? Yes, and then you listen for it again, and that's okay, how you know so it's that's back. that's what you do. Yeah, but it's... Uh... Okay. So yeah, for pulmonary disease, you know, you can follow their x-ray, their symptoms, their sputum dries up, they get smear negative, they get culture negative, you know, that you can use as, th those are the um, criteria for diagnosing cure. But uh, as I say, it's a fairly blunt instrument and even more so for extra pulmonary disease. Okay, um, what do you do with a person who's got a severe alcohol problem and they've got TB and they're yeah. drinking 12 drinks a day and yeah. they won't quit, but you gotta treat them? Yeah, Th those are tricky. I mean, it's the same with how do you treat their HIV or their Hep C or, you know, it comes up um, with almost everything. I mean, TB is a little different in that it's a real public health issue and, you know, they're living in a house and coughing on people or, what have you, and so there is a different sort of imperative that um, they really do have to be treated. And so it's an issue, because they're likely to develop hepatotoxicity, and then you've got to manage that. And there are some ways around it by uh, adjusting their TB treatment, but it um, uh, complicates everything if you can't get them to quit drinking. Very difficult. Yeah. More questions on tuberculin skin test. So. Yes. Uh, the optimal time to read is always said two to three days, but what if the yes. reading is at day seven? Yes, it's okay. It's okay. Really? Yep. This two to three days is just, there's no You actual... want it to be at least two days so that it has a chance, right? Correct. Yeah. Yes. Um, and the seven is pretty arbitrary too, to be honest, but three days clearly is just um, a number pulled out of the air, not based on any kind of science. I don't know why it's in all the guidelines, but it is. Okay. So. Uh, in the, let's keep this in the United States where everybody practices here. Yes. If there's a patient with latent TB uh, per PPD and no risk factors of progression, et cetera, would you treat empirically, like with active TB regimen, or would you just? Oh, uh, no. Yeah. No, no, no. If they only have a, they don't have active disease and they just have evidence of latent infection, treat them for latent infection. So give them nine months of INH or this weekly um, INH rifapentin. Our local health department will do sputum cultures uh, on all positive PPD or clinoferon patients with HIV regardless of symptoms. 
Any comment on that practice? Um, I think in the U.S. that's a waste of time and money. Uh, lots of times, I mean, people can't even, you know, asymptomatic people can't even produce a decent specimen unless they're like a heavy smoker or something. And so I just don't know how you'd interpret the results. I mean, I think it'd be incredibly uh, uncommon to turn up when someone actually coughed up some TB. Um, part, of the pro part of the issue is that you know, we think about latent infection in this bucket and active disease in this bucket, but of course it's not a uh, you know, yes, no thing, it's a, it's a spectrum. And so people that don't have very much TB in their body are considered to have latent infection and then it gets to be enough, you get symptoms and you have active disease. So there, are, there, are, there, there is evidence that if you test people with latent infection, occasionally they'll cough up um, a little bit of TB. You know, they'll have a, a one plus on a sputum smear. But there's also evidence that giving them the nine months of INH is plenty. They don't need the whole four, four drug regimen because treating what we call palsy bacillary disease or disease where there's not very much infection in the body, um, you can do that just with uh, single drug therapy. So in, for example, going back to the Eastern Cape, they do test, uh, they do screen uh, many HIV infected patients with a sputum looking for using this expert test to look for TB, but they see a ton of it. And in the US, I wouldn't recommend doing sputum testing. Yeah, I think we're out of time. Oh. Um, sorry. So, no, no. But, but as you're leaving, uh, meningitis, can you look at CSF on a gene expert? Can you use it? Yes. Can you use CSF? Yes, you can. Yeah, okay. You can. Now, it's, it may not, it's not FDA approved for that, and so you may have to argue with your lab to get them before. to do it, but yeah. it works. Great. Thank you so much. And you can tell by the number of questions, this is a hot topic. Thank you. And you'll be around through the break, and you've got to work up. Yeah. So who will be here. Thank you very much. Um, are we going to show the slide about workshops or is that from yesterday, uh, HCV? No? That was yesterday. Okay. Um, all right. Our next talk is a very, another hot topic about the opioid crisis. Um, we're very pleased to have uh, Petros Livonis with us. He is a chair of psychiatry at Rutgers in New Jersey and uh, we're very excited to hear his talk. He's going to give us uh, an overview about how we cause this problem ourselves. I suspect that's part of what he's going to say. And, uh, and, and the 16 milligrams that will bring your child back to college. Awesome. You're going to speak from here? Come on. Come on up. Yeah. Great. Welcome. Thanks very much, Mike. Okay. All right. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, conference. It's, uh, it's great to be here. The last day, so you're the diehards of the whole uh, event, so that's, that's fantastic. So what I would like to do is I would like to go over the, some of the ideas of how we got where we are and, of course, offer some uh, uh, suggestions for treatment and where to go from here. No financial disclosures. Um, okay, so we're going to start with a basic model, delve a little more into the neurobiology of addiction, then, as we said, to talk about the treatments and a couple of new directions at the end. Up until about 1980, 1990 or so, uh, people thought that addiction was a moral failure, or the weaklings of the world, the ones who couldn't resist the temptations of drugs and alcohol would be the ones who would succumb to the illness of addiction. And somewhere around that time, medicine came around and said, no, 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 no. Addiction is a medical illness, very much like uh, diabetes and schizophrenia and everything else. And it has biological, psychological, and social underpinnings, which are the true causes of addiction. And when these forces come together in a particularly nightmarish fashion, they change something in the brain, they flip the brain switch on, and from that point, the addiction has a life of its own to a very large extent, independent of the forces that set it in motion to begin with. Okay? What am I saying here? People may start using drugs because of genetics. If both your parents are alcoholics, you have seven times the chance of the general public to be an alcoholic yourself. Uh, People may be self-medicating, underlining, untreated psychiatric disorders because of psychological reasons and start using drugs. 
And then, of course, there's the microenvironments, the subcultures, the, uh, the neighborhoods within which we all live and love and play and work that define the addiction, the biological, psychological, and social forces. Let's say you have somebody who starts using opioids because they are self-medicating some kind of uh, untreated underlying back pain, or they maybe have gotten these um, medications from their doctor. Once the addiction has been engraved in the brain, once that brain switch has been flipped on, the addiction has a life of its own, and chances are that you will need treatment for the addiction in addition to whatever you're gonna be trying to do to relieve the cause of the addiction, whether it was back pain or depression or whatever else. A lot of our patients come to us and they live with a fantasy that if only we were smart enough to go in there unpack the original trauma, the original problem, lance the boil, as Freud would say, express the pus, relieve the pressure, then boom, they wouldn't be depressed, they wouldn't have pain, they wouldn't be addicted, and they would be home free. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Why? Because as soon as the addiction has been engraved in the more primitive part of the brain, it tends to have a life of its own and does require additional independent addiction treatment. That's it, we're like three minutes into the talk, I'm done. Uh, <laughs> everything else I'm gonna say is pretty much bells and whistles in that basic model. That's the model that we used to treat uh, addiction, to understand and treat addiction in 2017. Wonderful model, but it has a major flaw. Taken to the extreme, it suggests that in the absence of significant biological, psychological, or social forces, the risk of addiction is negligible. Let's think about this. You have a 16-year-old daughter who happens to have no biological burden. Her parents do not smoke cigarettes, her grandparents do not smoke cigarettes, no genetic, no biological predisposition. Let's say that 16-year-old has no ADHD, no depression, no anxiety, no eating disorders, no personality disorders, and does not have any psychological burden. And let's say that 16-year-old has a peer group who, doesn't, who don't smoke cigarettes. Her friends do not smoke cigarettes, no, none of her immediate environment smoke cigarettes. Would it be okay for us to go up to her and say, smoke away? You can smoke all the cigarettes in the world you want, and you will never become addicted to nicotine. Why? Because you lack the true causes of addiction, which are these biological, psychological, and social forces. How foolish, how crazy would that be, right? And yet, that's exactly what we did with the opioids. At some point, very foolishly, we felt that people who do not have the genetic burden who are not self-medicating any kind of psychological conditions and do not live in down-and-out, impoverished, and drug-infected uh, neighborhoods, they're home free. And that's why we have amended this model and we have introduced use of the drug itself. The very molecules of the drug entering your body can have the power to get you addicted. Of course, if you have this biological, psychological, and social vulnerabilities as well, your risk goes much higher but you are not home free if you do not have these biological, psychological, and social causes. All right, so that's the, the basic model. That's how we understand addiction. The big mistake, what happened to us? This is an article that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1980. It's one of the most frequently cited pieces of medical literature throughout the years, throughout all fields of medicine. It turns out it's not an article at all. It's a letter to the editor, a letter to the editor, 10 and a half lines, 10 and a half of the most damaging lines in all of medicine. Why? Because it gave us a ratio. It told us that out of 12,000 people who are gonna be using opioids, four are gonna be addicted, 12,000 to four. That was the infamous Porter and Zick article from the New England Journal of Medicine. It had been cited over and over and over and over and over again. Very, very recently, like two or three months ago, Dr. Zick came, uh, uh, gave an interview and said that how profoundly um, regretful he is 
of having published this non-article. When I started medical school in 1986, it was very, very clear to me that if I were to be one of those forward-thinking physicians, none like those goons of yesteryears, like my father and the like, I would prescribe away any pain the patient may have, opioids, high-dose opioids, no pain should be left untreated. And if anybody were to raise their hand and say, excuse me, what about addiction? Boom, there is the evidence. 12,000 to 4, over and over and over and over and over again. Needless to say, this was music to the ears of the pharmaceutical industry, who latched on that huge medical mistake and ran with it. And basically promised the world that if you feel like you're in pins and needles and you have all these pains, you're going to get our wonderful medications and you're going to emerge beautiful and strong and pain-free, and just you're going to conquer the world. That was the clear message that the pharmaceutical industry gave to the world, especially around the end of the millennium, the beginning of the new millennium. OK, what happened around that? This is a map of the United States in 1999. The lighter yellows show lower rates of admissions to prescription Opioids, non-heroin opioids means prescription opioids, oxycodone, hydrocodone, and the like. Um, this is 1999. This is 2001, 2003, 2005, 2007, 2009. Texas turned red as well. And from 2009, uh, we switch to mortality rates, uh, different uh, set of data, different uh, um, maps, but same idea. Here is, uh, in 1999, the uh, uh, map of the United States in terms of mortality from prescription opioids. Um, 2002, 2005, 2008, 2011, 2014 a raging of prescription opioid epidemic in the United States. You can certainly see some uh, parts of the country who are particularly affected. Florida, West Virginia is a huge issue. Here, of course, the Southwest. <laughs> and things are getting not all that much better. The blue line here is the curve of the prescription opioid um, epidemic. And if you stand on one leg and you squinch your eye a little bit, you can see some kind of plateauing of the prescription opioid. We did a lot of work. I, was part, I have been part of this work with, a prescri uh, with prescription monitoring programs, with uh, changing the formulation of the opioids so that are di more difficult to crush and inject and divert that way. And yes, the prescription opioids may be actually plateauing in some kind of way. But for a lot of our patients, this is coming a little too little, too late. And if you don't have access to your favorite prescription opioids, you know better. You're still addicted. You're still going to need to find your opioids. And you're going to go to heroin. Heroin in 2017 is particularly pure, which especially for, from an HIV perspective is particularly relevant because a lot of our, more than 50% of our patients addicted to heroin do not inject. They can snort the heroin and it's so pure that it gives you almost the same result as uh, your injection. The majority of our opioid addicted patients who seroconvert do not seroconvert because of needles, they seroconvert because of sex in 2017. We don't have that many rates in, New in the greater New York area, but that's what we see. So an explosion of heroin, which is relatively cheap, Baltimore, New York City, it's very, very easy to find and very cheap, uh, and as I said, quite pure. So we now have a heroin problem in our hands. All right, so that was our big mistake in medicine. That was the uh, greediness of the uh, pharmaceutical industry. 
Let's move on now to the brain itself. How would we understand uh, addiction from a neurobiological perspective, and how does that come into play? All right, we're essentially unpacking that brain switch that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. All of us have these pleasure-reward pathways in our brains, the mesolimbic system, the dopaminergic system, it's primarily innervated by dopamine, and what the system does is it scans the world at all times for things that they are pleasurable and rewarding. Actually, it does something more than that. It scans the world for things that are salient, for things that are important for us. Imagine your very own nucleus accumbens at this moment, the center of the mesolimbic system with the pleasure-reward pathways of the brain, and your dopamine level at the nucleus accumbens is about 100%. Nothing too good is happening, nothing too bad is happening. You are about the tonal level of about 100%. If you had an amazing meal right now, your dopamine level at the nucleus accumbens would probably jump to about 150% of its baseline. Sex does twice the job of food and jumps the dopamine level at the nucleus accumbens to about 200% of its baseline. Now, out of 30 million chemicals that we have identified in all of the universe, there are only about 250 that have this particular ability to go exactly at the very, very same centers and activate the mesolimbic system very much like food and sex. They jump the dopamine level at the nucleus accumbens about 200 to 150% of its baseline, and of course, these are the drugs of abuse. They are the ones who hi that hijack the pleasure-reward pathways of the brain. All right. Once the pleasure-reward pathways of the brain have been hijacked by a drug of abuse, they tend to remain so for a long, long, long time, perhaps most likely for the rest of the person's life. The reason for the incredible permanence of the hijacked pleasure-reward pathways of the brain is geographical is anatomical. Just above the nucleus accumbens and a little bit to the side is the hippocampus, the memory center of the brain. Below the nucleus accumbens and part of the nucleus accumbens is the limbic system, which is, of course, the center of emotions. So imagine what stronghold of our existence these hijacked pleasure-reward pathways take when they are essentially sandwiched between our memories and our emotions. And that's why we think they're just so, so, so incredibly permanent. Now, miles and miles and miles away from this whole drama that happens down here are the frontal lobes. Are the frontal lobes are responsible for abstraction, uh, planning, executive function, thinking, um, rational thinking. Fortunately or unfortunately, those frontal lobes are not so well connected to the more primitive part of the brain, to the limbic system. Below the age of 22, we feel that not even the hardware is fully developed between the frontal lobes and the limbic system. That's how we start to understand the adolescent who falls in love and fails to see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's not that much that she or he doesn't have fully developed frontal lobes, although this is part of it, but it's mostly that they cannot recruit those frontal lobes to modulate an explosive limbic system. Now, this disconnect, which of course survives in adulthood, is not all bad news. How do we start to think about the appreciation of the arts, or music, or sports? unless we are able to disconnect our frontal lobes from the more primitive part of the brain. Even having sex absolutely needs this disconnect. The whole idea of allowing another human being to enter your body or your body entering another human being is absolutely absurd from a frontal lobe perspective. <laughs> you absolutely need to cut this off in order to be able to have sex. And this is how we live and this is wonderful until or unless you're really addicted to a drug of abuse, at which point the one agency that you have that could modulate 
this beast is not really all that available to you. Ultimately, the war on drugs from a neurobiological perspective becomes a war between the hijacked pleasure reward pathways of the brain that scream, I want, I want, I want, I need, I need, I need, and the frontal lobes that try to keep the beast at bay. That's what I do when I see a patient of mine who is addicted. I immediately try to visualize how strong are her or his hijacked pleasure reward pathways versus how strong is her or his frontal lobes their resolve to stay sober. When the hijacked pleasure reward pathways win, the patient relapses. When the frontal lobes win, the patient is in recovery. And that's the two-part equation of addiction. How strong is this hijacking that's going up here versus how strong are the frontal lobes? Our job as clinicians is twofold. On one hand, we try to cool down that underlying engine the best we can, and we do that with medications when we have them available to us. And on the other hand, we try to beef up those frontal lobes the best we can, and we do that with psychotherapy and counseling so that we can maximize the gap between the hijacked pleasure reward pathways and the frontal lobes and keep the person safe. That's what we do. The combination of medication and psychotherapy and counseling tend to give us the best results as it maximizes that gap. Don't take me wrong. I'm not saying that addicted patients do not recover. The majority of patients who at some point in their, life, in their lives met criteria for a substance use disorder will end up beating the disorder. But the vulnerability, the vulnerability to go back to using stays with you for a long, long life, for a long, long time, if not for the rest of your life. Very much like a smoker. Nobody wakes up one morning and says, I want to be a cigarette smoker. It takes several weeks, several months to become addicted to nicotine. But if you have been a cigarette smoker and maybe you quit for 20 years and then you start again, when you start again, it will not take you several weeks and several months to become addicted to nicotine. Again, you're going to go back to two packs a day within a matter of days if you have a few puffs. Why? Because of the incredible permanence of the hijacked pleasure reward pathways of the brain. All right. Let's switch now to addiction treatments. What do we do about all this? Our first attempt back in the 1950s, 1960s was psychoanalysis, or psychoanalytically oriented treatment. <laughs> Uh, we didn't have that many tools in, in our uh, toolbox, so we put everybody on the couch and hope for the best. Absolute disaster. Why? What does psychoanalysis do best? Psychoanalysis is best at shrinking the frontal lobes. That's why we're called shrinks, the psychiatrist. We shrink the frontal lobes and we allow the more primitive part of the brain to take over. We, all, we essentially give permission to the patient to break some rules, have some fun, go out there, explore the world, and actually be happy. Not all that difficult and quite effective. You try to tell an addict that what I want to do with you is to shrink your frontal lobe so that it can allow the more primitive part of the brain to take over, and they're going to look at you as if you have three heads. If anything, the task is exactly the opposite. It's how we're going to beef up those frontal lobes, develop those life skills so that they can see the waking up of the pleasure reward pathways. CBT, as we're going to find out in a moment, cognitive behavioral therapy is particularly effective in doing that. So psychoanalysis failed, and actually, the failure of psychoanalysis to address addiction has been connected to the myth that addiction has no treatment. You see, if you have only one treatment for an illness and that treatment fails, then your conclusion is that the illness is untreatable. And that's what happened. So when psychoanalysis failed, then the majority of people, and there are still pockets of the population who still feel that addiction has no treatment because of that original failure of psychoanalysis. Second idea, boot camps, let's lock them up. Let's uh, sometimes literally shave them, shake them, uh, break down those defenses, slap them around, uh, confront the denial, and then build them from scratch total disaster. Uh, it started in California. It spread around the, the country. It completely has been put aside. People got worse, not better. And that brings us to today's world, the third wave of addiction treatment, 
which is essentially based on three components. Mutual help groups like Alcoholics Anonymous, motivational interviewing, and cognitive behavioral therapy, and medications. I put down family therapy, primary care services, mental health services, and aftercare, all of which have um, evidence behind them. There are evidence-based interventions. But the three workhorses of addiction treatment are mutual health groups, motivational interviewing, and medications. Let's go a little bit uh, in detail about those three areas. This is a study we did at Bellevue some years ago. And we asked medical staff to rank 11 things that they feel are most important for people's recovery. We simply asked medical staff, physicians, nurses, um, and medical students, what do you think is most important for patients' recovery? And uh, as you see here, housing and government services and medical services on the very top, and inner peace, God, spirituality, AA at the very bottom. Then we went and we asked patients the same question. What do you consider most important for your recovery? Just rank these 11 things. And a very different picture emerged with inner peace, God, AA at the top, job, government services at the bottom. And then Lisa Goldfarb had the amazing idea of going back to the medical staff and asking the following question. What do you think the patients think is most important for their recovery? Genius question, and look at that. The medical staff once again put on top housing and jobs and outpatient services and the very bottom, spirituality and God and inner peace. I'm not saying who's right, who's wrong here. I'm just saying that we live in a very different page that our patients live in. And not only that, not only we live in different pages, we don't even have a clue what that page is that our patients live in. A huge disconnect between the medical group and our patients. All right, motivational interviewing, a wonderful intervention. I'm sure uh, a lot of you may have been trained in motivational interviewing. Essentially, it addresses the following point. We used to tell our patients, come see me when you're ready. I've got nothing to offer to you unless you are ready to change. A terrible thing telling our patients, totally outdated in 2017 uh, uh, technology. But the reason why we used to say that is because the only thing you had was CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy, a wonderful intervention, but actually needs a lot of homework, a lot of work. You need to have some internal motivation to change. What do we do for all the patients who have minimal motivation to change their lives? We live in the pre-contemplation or contemplation stages of change. And that's where motivational interviewing comes in. I can start working in motivational interviewing with my patient, even if she or he says, I have zero interest in changing anything in my life. Particularly helpful for cannabis, particularly helpful for adolescents. If you haven't been trained already in motivational interviewing, it's just one of these modalities that would be quite easy to pick up and quite helpful. And then, finally, medications. Now. Traditionally, medications in addiction treatment followed two major strategies, two major paths. The first path was an agonist approach. Let me activate those receptors in a way very, very similar to the drug of abuse so that your cravings come down and you stay sober. The nicotine patch for tobacco probably would be the best example. Methadone for opioids would be another good example. The opposite strategy has been an antagonist strategy. Let me block the receptors. So, like for, for example, with naltrexone, you try to shoot up. Nothing happens. After a while, you say, this is too much money, too much trouble, too much legal exposure, and you stop using. The amazing innovation in our field has been the introduction of a third strategy of the partial agonists. Vareniclin for tobacco, buprenorphine, buprenorphine for opioids. The model, the most common prescription for buprenorphine is 16 milligrams. It should be the most common uh, prescription, be 16 milligrams a day of buprenorphine, and that's where the 16 milligrams comes in in the uh, uh, title of the talk. 
What, a, what buprenorphine does is a little bit of both of the classical strategies, or actually a lot of both. On one hand, it gives you a shield, it blocks the receptors, has amazing uh, affinity and very slow dissociation from the mu opioid receptor, but at the same time, it activates the cell at the 40% level, cutting down the cravings. A wonderful combination of the two. Huge advantage of buprenorphine over methadone, the fact that it's virtually impossible to overdose on buprenorphine. There's that ceiling effect, as you see here, and even at very, very high doses of buprenorphine, you cannot activate the opioid cell more than 40%, and therefore you do not see the respiratory depression that you may see with methadone. Methadone has no sense of humor, as we often say, and you screw up a little bit on the dose of methadone and you may have a significant situation in your hands. Not the same with buprenorphine. The other major advantage of buprenorphine over methadone is that you can prescribe it out of your own office. Physicians, NPs, and PAs are allowed if you have the waiver, which is just a little bit of coursework you do on the side, you can do it on the internet, you get the X number on your DEA uh, license, and you can prescribe buprenorphine out of your own office. It is clearly the number one, the first line of treatment for opioid use disorder in 2017. And finally, to finish up, a couple of uh, new directions. All right. A few years ago, a study was published in Nature that changed significantly what we think about addiction. It was a study of heavy smokers who had a stroke at the insula. The insula, some kind of part of the brain, I hadn't heard about it since medical school. Insula is the center of interoception, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So you take heavy, heavy, heavy smokers, they have a stroke in the insula, they obliterate the insula, and they come out on the other side, and not only they don't smoke cigarettes, which a lot of times happens when you have a life a catastrophic event, but also they have zero cravings for cigarettes. What happened to the hijacking of the pleasure reward pathways of the brain that I've been talking about, and this kind of permanence of all the cravings and the like? It seems that a necessary step for these cravings to get meaning is to go through the insula. Interoception is the function of the insula, and it's essentially an integrative function of all somatic sensations that we're sending to our brains. At all times, we keep on sending messages like, it's too cold, it's too hot, it's, uh, I have a little pain in my leg, uh, I have a craving for uh, some drug or cigarette or alcohol, um, I want to go to the bathroom, all these things, they go into the insula, but that's where they get meaning. Let me try to demonstrate that to you with an exercise, if I can. I know we're at the end of the lecture here, but we're, we're almost done, okay? It's only gonna be 20 seconds, we're all gonna get up when I say so, and I want you to do the following. I want you to focus on somatic sensations. For the past half an hour or so, your body has been sending messages to your insula, but hopefully, you find this lecture so fascinating that you have been ignoring all these messages that they are going into your insula, right? So I want for these 20 seconds that we're gonna close our eyes, I'm going to focus from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet and give some kind of uh, meaning to those somatic sensations, okay? It's a little game, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Let's all get up. And let's close our eyes. Perfect, you can sit down. Does there somebody want to tell me something that they realize that is going on in their body that maybe they hadn't realized the past half hour? Go ahead. Your bladder is getting full, excellent, exactly. I, I, I beat the bladder, okay, <laughs> the lecture was better than the bladder, I'm very happy about that. So that's exactly what we're trying to do with mindfulness for our addicted patients. At the very, very last minute, 
when the hijacked pleasure reward pathways have overwhelmed the frontal lobes, you've done all the motivational interviewing exercises that you can, you've taken the medications, you've called your sponsor from the AA, you've done all the things and you're ready there to use your heroin, there may be a last split moment there where you can dissociate, you can actually find your observing ego and see your life as happening to somebody else through mindfulness exercises and duplicate in some ways the obliteration of the insula that we found that Nazir Nakvi found with his stroke patients. Nobody is suggesting psychosurgery, nobody is saying to go in there and mess with the insula, but what we do say is that maybe mindfulness can duplicate that kind of effect, and this is really the frontier of addiction treatment in 2017. We do have some evidence behind it, we published a textbook about it, although we cringed because we didn't have quite as much information about it, but we felt that it was so powerful that it had to be uh, put out there. All right, one more and we are done, uh, almost on time. And this is uh, back to Freud, back to psych psychodynamics, because psychoanalytically oriented psychotherapy, or sometimes called also psychodynamic psychotherapy, may have its place in addiction treatment. This is a reanalysis of the NISARC data, and uh, sexuality can be uh, assessed along the dim three dimensions. Um, sexual identity, do I see myself as straight, gay, bisexual, or neither? Uh, sexual behavior, do I sleep with men, women, both, or neither? And sexual attraction, which is a more intrinsic, more internal sexuality, best approximated by an interrogation of uh, dreaming and uh, masturbation and things like that. It's the Kinsey style, more dimensional sexuality from, let's say, completely straight to completely gay. So when we analyze the data in terms of sexual attraction, we find something rather interesting. The shape of the curve between women and men are, is about the same, so let's just concentrate on the left side of this graph. On the y-axis, we have some record of substance use disorders, and on the x-axis, we have sexuality. Yellow is completely straight, Green is completely gay, red is bisexual. And what we see is this fascinating, oops, fascinating curves here for people who are almost gay but not exclusively and almost straight but not exclusively. And it seems that these groups may be at the highest risk of substance use disorders, and that's of course where psychodynamic psychotherapy, which is does the best job in exploring more intrapsychic forces, motives, and the like to help these people live a less stressful life and perhaps use drugs less. The idea there being that if you either accept your more murky sexuality or you find yourself in one of the more socially uh, well-established groups of gay, straight, or bisexual, you would feel less stress and therefore that may translate into less drug use. All right. Two conclusions I would like you to take from this, uh, from this lecture. Essentially, addiction is the hijacking of the pleasure reward pathways of the brain and the weakening of the frontal lobes. And in terms of addiction treatment, AA, NA, and the other 12-step groups, motivational interviewing and CBT, as well as medications, most particularly partial agonists, buprenorphine for opioids, are the state-of-the-art treatments of 2017. Thank you very much. I'll sit down and think. Wonderful. I, what I learned is what happens uh, over time is the U.S. turns from blue to red. That seems to be uh, something that happened <laughs> in your slides. Um, I have to think about that. <laughs> the, other thing, the other thing I noticed was uh, that it, I guess it explains that Freud did a lot of frontal lobe shrinking on his own, and that's why he was addicted to cocaine, I guess, at some point, right? Well, yeah, so much to be said about that. <laughs> okay, all right, fine. So let's get into the questions from the group. Um, uh, is there a good alternative to AA if for patients who don't really kind of get into that Absolutely. messaging? Absolutely. We don't have just AA. We have other 12-step programs. Smart Recovery uh, has uh, uh, grown outside of AA. And of course, there is psychotherapy, like uh, in the motivational interviewing and CBT. This being said, and I, I would be the first one to say that AA is not for everyone, don't take that easy exit all that quickly. Uh, it is a powerful, powerful intervention. 
In 2017, there are gazillion uh, AEA groups all around the world. Uh, in New York City, we have extremely specialized uh, uh, groups. So if the person has not found uh, her or his niche somewhere uh, with this group, she or he may want to go and explore at least three different AA groups before uh, she or he writes them off. And of course, we don't believe that uh, you have to be religious to go into AA. You don't have to believe in God. Uh, you just have to believe in a higher power. And that higher power is defined as absolutely anything you want as long as it's not yourself. It has to be something outside of yourself so that you can take some of the burden of illness and put it on something else. It can be nature, it can be the fellowship of AEA, it can be something bigger than you, but not you. Helpful, thanks. Um, Sue. Russ, that was a fabulous talk, and I'm just so pleased I didn't have to go after you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the way you put that one, I yeah, think you yeah. did quite well. <laughs> so uh, I, I live in Nebraska, where you actually can't get good heroin, it turns out. And so we have problems with patients addicted to methamphetamine. I know this is outside your topic, but it would be incredibly helpful if you could give some recommendations about what you know you would recommend for treatment for people addicted to meth, because that's a huge problem okay. where we live, and I think many others in the audience. I do welcome questions about anything in addiction, including the behavioral addictions, in the addiction to internet, uh, sex, uh, gambling, and the like. So yes, crystal methamphetamine is a unique situation. I showed you the, the dopamine spikes at the nucleus accumbens, and if you looked a little more closely, you would see that cocaine went up to 300, 350% of its baseline. Crystal methamphetamine goes way over 1,000% of the baseline, and in the context within which it's used, it's most people like Steve Lee hypothesize that's like 4,000, 5,000% of the dopamine flood in the brain. So, that has significant clinical implications. We have changed the way that we talk to patients about addiction because of crystal methamphetamine. Before crystal methamphetamine came to town, a big part of addiction treatment was to convince the patient that life in sobriety would be as exciting, if not more exciting, than it was when they were drinking and drugging. You can't look a crystal methamphetamine addict in the eye and say, Trust me, sex in sobriety will be as exciting, if not more exciting, than it was when you were high on crystal meth. They will immediately know that you are lying, that you haven't done crystal methamphetamine, and will discredit you. <laughs> so we have come up with other, we we'll talk about trade-offs. Sure, you won't have that kind of sex again, but perhaps you may want to keep your teeth, or you may want to keep your children or you may want to keep your life, or there may be other things that are important for you that you may be willing to give up this for that. No medications. No medication for crystal methamphetamine. We've tried, 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 tried for stimulants. It has been the proverbial holy grail of, of, our, of our field. We haven't been able to find anything for uh, stimulants. Every few months, something becomes promising and, and encouraging, and then it fizzles out. Okay. A um, couple, a lot of questions here about medical cannabis. Um, I guess the number one theme that's coming through is what about its use as a substitution for addiction to opioids? No. No. That is not correct. We do not have evidence that medicinal marijuana is a treatment for opioid use disorder. It does not uh, seem to be helping. It seems to be getting people in more trouble. Uh, there have been other disorders for which uh, uh, tetrahydrocannabinol has been helpful. There is very little question that has significant analgesic properties, that it does help uh, with pain. It is uh, an anti-nausea medication. It does help, of course, with appetite, but it has not been shown to be a treatment for opioid use disorder and should not be used uh, uh, as, as such. We have other treatments, primarily buprenorphine, but also uh, naltrexone and methadone and psychotherapies that are way better evidence-based and they do the trick. Corollary question is what about marijuana as a gateway drug and are you concerned about some of the states that have legalized its recreational use? Yeah, we used to think very much about this progression from uh, um, cigarettes to alcohol to marijuana to cocaine to heroin. 
uh, as kind of like a, a step ladder to, to uh, bigger and bigger drugs. We don't think of that quite as much. There are some synergies. There are some uh, uh, clusters of, uh, of teenagers who uh, break the law more, do drink alcohol more, do uh, uh, use cannabis, and then they do have a higher risk of uh, uh, using heroin and other opioids as well. But this uh, step ladder and uh, temporarily arranged gateway th theory has been uh, challenged quite a lot these days. What about uh, patients who are addicted to prescription drugs, for example, uh, uh, Percocet, Narco, et cetera, and if they're heavily addicted and they become abusive to their partner and they don't want to go to rehab, and what do you do? That's, uh, that's a great question here. Uh, so what do we do? I, I talked before about uh, uh, the traditionally medicine would start at the point of uh, resolution, where the patient is resolved to do something about their addiction. And now we have expanded the scope of work, and we can start working with patients who have no interest in uh, coming to see us. I, I'm sorry, no interest in changing anything in their lives, and we do that through motivational interviewing. Very recently, we have expanded this spectrum, this scope of, of work even further, and we start working with patients who refuse to come to the office, who refuse to come and see us, and they see absolutely nothing wrong, and they do not want to go and see the doctor. What we do is we bring in the family. We bring the family in the, uh, in the office, and we teach them motivational interviewing. One uh, 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 critical part of motivational interviewing is to identify little discrepancies in the patient's life a discrepancy between where they are and where they would like to be. And if they don't want to do this work with me at the office, I can very much instruct the family to start doing this kind of work at home. In my clinical experience, greatest help, siblings. Siblings, siblings, siblings. Brothers and sisters of the addicted patient. We very often talk about spouses, we very often talk about parents, we very often talk about children. The siblings have been an incredible resource they have the love for the, for, the, for the patient, but also they have some kind of distance uh, from them. They are usually not financially dependent on the patient. There are a lot of good things going on in the sibling relationship. They can be an incredible ally in your uh, treating of, a, of somebody who's addicted. Okay. And I, it, there's a lot of questions I'm not going to be able to get to. I guess we'll finish with this one. Um, it's, it's really about the use of uh, stimulants, for example, uh, Ritalin or... Uh, uh, other drugs that are used for so-called ADD, and uh, we have kids ADD, who come not up. for so-called ADD. For okay, ADD, for ADD. Yeah. <laughs> so-called okay. ADD. <laughs> and 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 those who are treated with so-called Ritalin, um, are you concerned? Are you concerned? Ultimate universe here. Are right. you concerned about uh, what happens? I mean, everyone's uh, all for it while kids are in, at school, but what happens when they become adults, and how do we manage that in the clinic yeah. over time? Yeah. Um, there is, um, first of all, methamphetamine, crystal methamphetamine smoked in a, in, a, in a pipe in a sexual environment or in a high environment is a completely different uh, situation than taking a methamphetamine pill to treat your ADHD. The dosing is different, the route of administration is different, and, and so on. Of course, the, do, the stimulant pills, both methylphenidate and the amphetamines, do have an addictive potential. Now, the tricky part is the following. If you do suffer from bona fide ADHD and you do not treat it with methylphenidate or amphetamines, then you increase the risk of the person become addicted to street stimulants further down the line. If, however, somebody does not have ADHD and you misdiagnose it and you give them a diagnosis of ADHD and you treat them with uh, methylphenidate or uh, met methamphetamine or amphetamine, then again you increase the risk of somebody becoming addicted further down the line. So we've become quite lazy in psychiatry in our diagnosis because so much stuff does quite well with SSRIs and SNRIs. Who cares if somebody has anxiety or depression or OCD or PTSD? The pharmacological treatment is very, very, very similar. Not so much when it comes to bipolar disorder, but even more importantly, when it comes to ADHD. I pride myself of being a general psychiatrist, and I see all kinds of patients. I have stopped seeing patients for ADHD because you can make a huge mistake by either giving the diagnosis to somebody who doesn't have it or not giving the diagnosis for somebody who does have it and does need diagnostic expertise not to make that big mistake. Uh, so someone who truly has ADHD, then giving them these drugs as sort of prep 
to keep them off methamphetamine in the Correct. future. Got Correct. it. Okay, Correct. great. Thank you very much. Uh, great job. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the workshop later today, right? And you have a workshop later. Yeah, 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 yeah. perfect. I was Thank you. To advertise it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Our anchor leg here is our co-chair, uh, Marsh Glesby, who um, everyone knows by now. And he's going to wrap up uh, the, the meeting with a discussion, kind of a potpourri of all of the um, comorbid conditions and the myriad of complications of HIV and its treatment. Uh, and so we look forward to this uh, concluding talk by Marshall. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Mike. And uh, unlike Sue, I actually do have to follow Dr. Lavuna, so it's uh, definitely a tough act to follow. And uh, despite the somewhat grandiose title, I'm going to just focus on uh, a few complications that I think are sort of emerging as important things that we all need to be thinking about in our clinical practices. And we heard a great talk uh, yesterday from, from David Spock about uh, infectious complications, OIs, and really going to focus on non-infectious issues. Here's my disclosure information. And uh, the learning objectives, uh, so we're, I'm going to spend roughly half the time talking about issues related to uh, liver enzyme elevations. It's going to be case-based, so you can get your, your phones or devices out. And, um, and then going to also talk about uh, not so much management, but more screening for some of the other uh, comorbid conditions. So this case is a 54-year-old man diagnosed with HIV in 1998. He started cytovidine, lamivudine, plus lopinavir ritonavir in 2006. Uh, about six months later, simplified his regimen by changing to uh, TDF FTC efavirenz, and then uh, transferred his care to our clinic in 2012, and has been followed by one of my colleagues down the hall. He had a history of pneumocystis pneumonia in 2006 before starting antiretroviral therapy. His Nader CD4 count was in the 20s and actually had a history of uh, pulmonary tuberculosis at age 18 that was uh, appropriately treated. He's uh, originally from Brazil of, of an Italian descent, immigrated to the U.S. at age 25. He's employed as a teacher. His husband is HIV infected, uh, no history of illicit drug use, uh, never drinks alcohol, and has never smoked cigarettes. So the current issue that we're going to focus on is persistent elevations of his liver enzymes. Uh, we don't have data prior to his uh, transferring care to our clinic, but at least during his time in our clinic, the last four or five years, has had liver enzyme elevations. And um, this is uh, literally from our electronic medical record. This is his ALT, um, which we see has been perhaps trending upward, but definitely elevated you know, roughly two to three times the upper limit of normal. Just a word about upper limit of normal for liver enzymes and ALT specifically. Although many of our labs have upper limits of maybe 40, 45, sometimes even higher, uh, those are based on you know, population-based data that include a significant proportion of people who actually have underlying liver disease. So hepatologists like to say that the healthy upper limit of normal uh, should be around 30 for men and 19 for women. So just keep that in mind. And if you look at his AST, similar trend, you know, maybe two to three times uh, the upper limit of normal. His other liver tests, total bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase, uh, or normal, his platelet count, which we can, um, it will be often low in the setting of cirrhosis and portal hypertension, uh, has also been normal. On exam, uh, he looks fine. His blood pressure is uh, reasonable. His body mass index is in the uh, overweight range. His abdomen is protuberant. Uh, no obvious ascites on exam, though we're, we're not great at being able to tell that clinically. Uh, no hepatosplenomegaly, and he has no other stigmata of uh, advanced liver disease. The rest of his exam is normal. Uh, in terms of uh, the rest of his evaluation, his um, prothrombin time, or INR, uh, is normal. His albumin is normal. Hepatitis serology, surface antigen negative, core antibody negative, surface antibody positive, and his hepatitis C antibody is negative. He also had a lab sent to uh, evaluate for autoimmune hepatitis, so anti-nuclear antibody, anti-smooth muscle antibody, and anti-mitochondrial antibodies, all of which were negative. And he had iron studies to look for hemochromatosis or iron overload, which is important to rule out, and, and those studies were also normal. 
So uh, the question for you is, the most likely cause, given this information, of his uh, persistent transaminase elevations is which of the following? And I view his serologies for hepatitis listed at the bottom. Uh, acute hepatitis C, occult hepatitis B infection, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, Favrin hepatotoxicity, or something else. So please go ahead and vote. Okay, so three quarters going with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and uh, the next most popular, Favrin's hepatotoxicity. So I'm gonna ask the next question then we'll come back to, uh, to both questions. What would you do next? Now granted, you could do more than one of these things, but what do you think would be the most informative thing if you had you know, the ability to do any of these? Liver imaging by say ultrasound, referral for a liver biopsy, check a hepatitis C viral load, check a hepatitis B DNA level, or change of favorins to dolutegravir to see what happens. Okay, so overwhelming majority going with uh, ultrasound, which I think is a good choice, uh, and then sort of a smattering of other things. So let's go over both questions. In terms of the differential diagnosis, and I think people, um, you know, most people picked up on this, uh, you know, while we have to think about acute hepatitis C, and certainly uh, Arthur Kim emphasized that yesterday, um, the chronicity of these liver enzyme elevations would make this unlikely. Could he have acute hepatitis C on top of some underlying process? I suppose that's possible, but uh, not generally what we would be thinking of as being high up on our list. Occult hepatitis B is a known entity. Dr. Kim alluded to it yesterday. Typically, we see a core antibody as the only positive serology, and these people may have a low-level hepatitis B viremia. and. Um, uh, this patient, again, had surface antibody positivity only consistent with uh, immunization uh, for hepatitis B. And non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, I think, uh, is the, the most likely diagnosis, and in fact was the diagnosis, as we'll get to. Uh, so we'll talk more about that. Hepatotoxicity from efavirenz can occur. It typically occurs within the first couple of months of starting the drug, and it usually manifests in the context of a, a more of a general hypersensitivity reaction with fever and rash. So this person had been on efavirenz for many years, so we would not expect that to be a likely cause at this point in time. And of course, it can always be something else. So in terms of the, the options, um, I think uh, liver imaging would be a great place to start. You could go directly to liver biopsy. It wouldn't be, uh, I think, a wrong thing to do. Uh, but we often like to have some basic information from imaging uh, to start out with. And we'll talk about kind of an algorithm for approaching this uh, in, in a moment. Uh, hepatitis C viral load, hepatitis B levels, uh, DNA level, I think uh, you know, maybe not the optimal thing. Whoops, if we could go back. Uh, and then changing efavirenz to dolutegravir, uh, I think not very many people opted for. Uh, I'm going to touch on later a study that was, has been e-published ahead of print in CID of uh, switching from efavirenz to raltegravir that is actually, I think, kind of intriguing. Uh, I don't have a slide on it because it literally was published about 10 days ago, but I'll, I'll try to remember to come back to that. But probably, I think, you know, option one or two would be the best choice. I personally would go with uh, liver imaging by ultrasound. So this patient did have an ultrasound, and it showed, um, as you might expect, diffusely increased echogenicity consistent with fatty infiltration of the liver. So this patient has fatty liver disease. If he uh, reported a history of significant drinking, we would not be able to tell whether it's related to alcohol or what we call non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in the absence of significant alcohol use. And even pathologically, uh, you really can't distinguish between those two. So we really have to rely on the history. Uh, the patient also had some metabolic labs sent, which I think are uh, a good thing to be thinking about doing. So he had a fasting glucose level uh, that was in the impaired fasting glucose range, so between 100 and 125. 
above 125 would be consistent with diabetes. We'd want to confirm that. Uh, and his fasting insulin level, which is probably not a test that many of us get on a routine basis, can be informative in this setting. His was 25.9. The upper limit in our lab was, uh, was actually on the high end of uh, 25. But we can use these two pieces of data, the fasting glucose and contemporaneously measured fasting insulin level, together to calculate something called homeostatic model assessment insulin resistance, or HOMA-IR. Uh, which may be new to some of you. And um, there's a formula. The formula that I have here is actually um, based on different units than what most labs uh, use. So you have to either convert the units or you can find a formula that, that uses the standard units. Or you can just go online like I did here and use this calculator, input the two uh, pieces of information, we get a number of 6.5. So what does that mean? Perfectly normal would be closer to one. Most people define insulin resistance as being in the, you know, above the two, 2.5, three range. Um, you know, it's not an exact cutoff. So his is clearly abnormal though and consistent uh, with uh, insulin resistance. And that helps us when we think about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, insulin resistance is a cardinal feature that we see in association with that. People think of fatty liver disease as being kind of the liver uh, manifestation of metabolic syndrome. So histologically, if this patient were to have a liver biopsy, this is what a normal liver looks like. And um, you see these nice hepatocytes here. The white spaces are the sinusoids. The blood percolates through there and gets filtered by the liver and detoxified. And um, these images are taken from a really a great review article uh, by Mary Ranella from uh, Northwestern, published a couple of years ago in uh, JAMA, just about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in general, not specific to HIV. And in the upper left, I've summarized what, um, whoops, sorry, a common definition is of significant alcohol use, so over 15 drinks per week for men and 10 drinks per week uh, uh, for women. And then uh, what's shown here, going from left to right, is sort of the spectrum of fatty infiltration of the liver and associated uh, pathologic features. So on the far left, we have uh, steatosis alone. So these white areas are, um, they're not actually the fat globules themselves, so we can think of it that way. It's really where the fat uh, had been, and then the staining sort of shows the absence of uh, the normal uh, histologic findings because there had been fat present in the cells. So in the middle, or the left, I'm sorry, is just uh, fat itself, so simple steatosis. Uh, and then in the middle, we have steatosis with a little bit of uh, infiltration of inflammatory cells, maybe hard to make out. Uh, this is all just considered non-alcoholic fatty liver, or NAFL, and about three quarters of people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease would fit into that category in the general population. Then on the right here, we have what's called NASH, or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, where we see more of a significant inflammatory infiltrate here, again, the steatosis, and then you can see these characteristic cells uh, that are ballooned here, an enlargement of the cells. And then if we take these people who have NASH, which again is about a quarter of these people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, some of them will progress and develop fibrosis and some ultimately uh, develop uh, cirrhosis. So those are obviously the complications that we're most worried about. So overall in the general population, the estimates are less than 4% of people with uh, NAFL. So the people um, in these two groups over here will progress to cirrhosis. But if we look at the people who actually have NASH, uh, then the percentage goes up to around 20% progression to cirrhosis. And then we have to worry about uh, hepatocellular carcinoma developing in that setting. So um, on these uh, two figures here, we see fibrosis. The collagen is staining blue here on this trichrome strain, stain, and then this is actual cirrhosis. So there are some data, I would say they're not great data, but uh, some data that uh, NASH may be more common in people living with HIV. So the first study I'm going to review is by Karen Morse from the NIH Clinical Center, published in CID a couple of years ago. She looked at um, around 60 people who had persistent liver enzyme elevation, so for at least six months, did not have evidence of viral hepatitis or any other known cause for their liver enzyme elevations, and found that over half of them had NASH on liver biopsy, so they all underwent liver biopsies as part of the study. Um, over 40% had fibrosis, and 16% had advanced uh, or bridging fibrosis, which is sort of a precursor uh, of uh, cirrhosis. No control group here. And then this study did have a control group, but it's very small. So it looked at 33 people 
with what they called primary NAFLD, uh, meaning uh, p not people without HIV, and then uh, shown in blue, and then in the greenish color are people with HIV and NAFLD. And on biopsy, we see that the people with HIV, uh, over 60% had evidence of NASH. Uh, whereas uh, less than 40% of the people without HIV had evidence of NASH. And then even after adjustment for factors like age, sex, ethnicity, and BMI, uh, this difference between the two groups persisted. So some suggestion, at least from two relatively small studies, that NASH may be more common in people with HIV. And uh, I apologize, this may be a little hard to see, but um, this is uh, depicting the pathogenesis of NASH in general. And I'm going to highlight some of the HIV uh, perhaps HIV-specific or issues we worry about more in people with HIV. So whenever you see a bunch of boxes and arrows, it usually means that we don't really understand the pathogenesis, which I think is the case uh, with NASH. But it's, people think of it as a two-hit type of thing. So first, the development of fatty liver, which is often related to metabolic factors, uh, including uh, increased visceral fat, insulin resistance, uh, perhaps inflammation contributing. And then uh, once the steatosis is present, shown here, then there's a second hit, which can be uh, inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress, leading to this progression, activation of the stellate cells in the liver, which produce collagen. Then we have collagen deposition, fibrosis, and potentially uh, cirrhosis developing. So I've circled some of the things that you know may be more prevalent in some people with HIV. So on the far left, we have uh, uh, in pro-inflammatory mediators. We've heard a lot about inflammation at this conference already in people with HIV, even well-controlled HIV. Increased visceral adipose tissue seen in some people with quote-unquote lipodystrophy who have that manifestation of increased abdominal fat like our patient, I'm sorry, probably did. Uh, insulin resistance, again, common. Our patient clearly had altered glucose metabolism, perhaps increased uh, fatty acid production, alterations in lipid metabolism, very common both potentially due to HIV and some of the medications we use to treat HIV. Intestinal dysbiosis refers to alterations in the microbiome in the gut, and um, those do appear to be uh, common in people living with HIV and maybe contributing. You know, the gut uh, uh, goes through the portal circulation directly to the liver, the, is where the blood flows, so there may be factors uh, related to that that are affecting the liver as well. And then mitochondrial dysfunction, we don't think of so much with the drugs that we currently use, uh, you know, we think of it more of the you know, D4Ts, idobidine, DDI, et cetera. Uh, but there um, may, in fact, be some mitochondrial effects of efavirenz uh, that have come up in, in recent years. So it is something to be uh, potentially thinking about. And oxidative stress, some studies suggesting that may be a problem in certain people with HIV. So I'm going to just walk you through uh, an algorithm from this uh, review article by Renella. Uh, I divided it in sort of into two parts. Uh, first. Uh, starting out with your patient, you know, the most important thing is to clinically suspect uh, hepatic steatosis. And then um, the first step, as uh, most of you picked, was to do liver imaging. And we, again, would often do an ultrasound. Those CT or MRI could potentially be used as well. And then um, with her approach, uh, if you have risk factors for NASH, and they're shown here, so metabolic syndrome, uh, diabetes or insulin resistance, hypertension, central obesity, uh, hypertriglyceridemia, low HDL, so um, uh, as we'll see, our patient had many of these features, uh, age over 60, or family history of diabetes. And I'll throw in, this is not in her article, but perhaps HIV, based on the data that we uh, just reviewed. Um, if there are risk factors, we're going to go to the other side of the algorithm, which we'll get to in a minute. But if there's no risk factors for NASH, which again may not, we, we sort of debatable how to classify someone with HIV without any of these other risk factors, um, the recommendation would be a trial of weight loss. And then if that works, that's great. Just follow the patient. If it doesn't work, then proceed to liver biopsy. Uh, and, and I should say the other um, aspect of this is if they have uh, concerns you know, about advanced cirrhosis or liver disease, or cirrhosis, advanced fibrosis, so features including AST to ALT ratio that's elevated uh, thrombocytopenia, elevated INR or elevated bilirubin, you know, obviously not related to something like atazanavir, then you might um, uh, also go down the left-hand side that I'm going to review uh, next. So uh, if we're going down this side, which may apply to many of our people with HIV, then um, the next step would be if 
you have access to it would be to consider um, non-invasive fibrosis imaging. So the most common modality uh, would be vibration-controlled transient elastography, which people commonly refer to as FibroScan. And uh, you know, available certainly at some uh, major medical centers, but probably not in you know something that is easily accessible accessible to most people. There's some other uh, more investigational technologies like a magnetic resonance elastography. There's something called ultrasound with ARFI, which uh, sounds for acoustic radiation force impulse, which I have no idea what that is, but it has been done in some studies of uh, NAFLD. And then. Um, if the uh, results are really consistent with cirrhosis, then you um, may not need to do a liver biopsy. You kind of have your diagnosis there. If not, then it would be reasonable to um, uh, proceed with uh, a liver biopsy. And uh, if they you know, have evidence of cirrhosis, then we need to worry about screening for hepatoma. So just a word about uh, FibroScan. There is actually a, a newer technology, a different probe and, and software that can be added to the standard FibroScan, which is uh, giving us an indication of fibrosis, called the controlled attenuation parameter. And it's able to measure the ultrasound attenuation due to uh, fatty infiltration of the liver. So it, with that combined with, with, with traditional modality that's measuring stiffness of the liver that can be you know, correlated with fibrosis, we can get two pieces of information that can be very useful. And in fact, that's what this patient had. I recognize that you may not have access to this in many of your clinical settings. But he had, uh, so the traditional um, transient elastography or fiber scan that uh, had a, a high measurement here, pressure indicating that um, he, he likely had advanced fibrosis. This is a good test in general, sort of at both ends of the spectrum. So if you have no fibrosis or a lot of fibrosis in the middle, it's not so great at making the distinction at this point. Uh, and he had this uh, controlled attenuation parameter measurement. And uh, the numbers here, you know, I think from the, my review of the literature, there's not cutoffs I think that everyone has agreed upon. It sort of varies from study to study. Steatosis is often graded by the degree of, of liver fat. There's S1, S2, S3. S3 being more than 66% of hepatocytes containing fat. Um, so this person was in the S1, S2 range. They really couldn't make that distinction, but between 5 and 66%. Less than 5% would be considered normal, so we know he has abnormal fat accumulation and significant fibrosis and doesn't have viral hepatitis, so I think we can um, safely conclude that this patient probably has NASH with advanced fibrosis and is certainly at risk of, of cirrhosis. So you could argue whether a liver biopsy would be useful at this point in time or whether you have enough information now to really uh, appropriately manage the patient. So in terms of, ma of management, if we assume this patient has NASH, uh, what would you recommend? diet and exercise alone, uh, or diet and exercise plus something else, uh, obeta-colic acid, pioglitazone, metformin, or vitamin E? Okay, interesting. So uh, the majority uh, by a hair going with uh, diet and exercise plus metformin, uh, about a third going with diet and exercise alone, and very few takers for some of these other things. Okay, great. So let's go over some of the things that uh, have been studied. Mo almost all the data are from the general population. We really have very, very few studies in people with HIV and NASH. There's some studies uh, in hepatitis C with uh, some coexisting fatty liver disease um, that I'm not going to really get into today. So really, uh, diet and exercise have been the mainstays of managing uh, NASH and non-alcoholic non fatty liver disease in general in the general population, and I think probably should be our mainstay at this point in people with HIV absent uh, other data. So the estimates are, and those of you doing the post-test and wanting the MOC credit, uh, remember this point. Estimates are uh, you need at least 5 to 10 percent weight loss to reduce hepatic fat and perhaps over 10 percent to reduce necroinflammation. Um, how to in, you know, try to get patients to lose weight is, is obviously a challenge. Um, some people advocate low carbohydrate diets with low trans fat. Uh, others advocate Mediterranean diet. I would just say the data are not really clear on this, and probably anything that leads to weight reduction uh, uh, may have some benefit. I'm not sure it matters so much what the specific diet is, or at least we don't have data, great data, to suggest that one type of diet is better than another. 
Avoiding alcohol is really important to anybody with any type of liver disease, um, so that would be something certainly to be advising patients on. If somebody you know, happens to be you know, like the occasional patient who is on an older NRTI, it would be appropriate to switch them to something else uh, you know, based on their treatment history. I don't think we have compelling data that switching from protease inhibitor to a different type of drug uh, is a useful management strategy, although I think we just don't have a lot of data. Um, and I, as I alluded to earlier, there was a study uh, published in, uh, electronically so far in CID from a Spanish group literally about 10 days ago, uh, a 40 or so patient study, randomized trial of uh, switching people, all of whom were on a, a Favrin's-based regimen and had evidence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease by uh, this transient elastography with CAP, and uh, found that uh, they were randomized to stay on a Favrin's or switch to raltegravir. And the people who switched to raltegravir had statistically significant decreases in liver fat. There were no biopsies. We don't know about fibrosis, per se. Uh, but there, um, uh, at least in this very small study, a suggestion that switching from a favorin to raltegravir led to improvement in liver fat. I don't think it's something we can you know, be rushing to do in our clinical practices based on literally you know, 40 patient study. But I think the data are intriguing and, and worthy of further follow-up. So some of these other options, uh, vitamin E is something that has been studied uh, in the general population and um, can re improve necroinflammation. It, it has antioxidant properties, uh, but does not seem to have any beneficial effects on fibrosis. So it's really not a popular choice. Uh, and this, the data were from really people without diabetes and, and without cirrhosis. And um, uh, there is concern about possible increased cardiovascular risk in some studies of vitamin D supplementation, as well as increased risk of prostate cancer. So probably not something we should be rushing to do, uh, which I think consistent with how you voted. Pioglitazone is a thiazolidinedione drug, an insulin sensitizing drug that's uh, popular, uh, you know, it has been used certainly for diabetes, has some uh, concerns associated with it, uh, including uh, propensity to, to uh, cause or predispose to congestive heart failure, fluid overload weight gain, uh, and uh, potential adverse effects on bone mineral density. So it may not be a great drug for many of our patients. Uh, it does have some modest effects on histology in a randomized trial in the general population. Um, the New England Journal reference there, reference number three. So something that could be considered uh, for certain patients. Uh, many of you um, went for uh, metformin, which I think is a reasonable drug for this particular patient because he is pre-diabetic and overweight. Uh, and I, I don't think it would be certainly appropriate to, to consider that. Uh, in fact, for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it does not seem to be any better than just lifestyle modification alone. And uh, the reference here is a, a recently published uh, meta-analysis, again, in the general population. But because of this patient's other uh, you know, history, I think it would be a reasonable thing to be thinking about. Obeta-colic acid is an interesting drug. It's actually FDA approved for refractory primary biliary cirrhosis, probably not something that we're uh, managing typically, uh, but does look promising for NASH. Uh, it's uh, what's called a, a Farnesoid X nuclear receptor agonist, and it has effects of reducing lipid production and um, reducing glucose production within the liver. So it improves uh, insulin sensitivity, but actually has adverse effects on lipids. So we don't know how this drug might work in people with HIV, particularly those with underlying dyslipidemia. And it, uh, there are, I believe, plans to, to study this within the AIDS clinical trials group. Tessamorelin, uh, I didn't give you that as an option. It's a FDA-approved growth hormone releasing factor agonist. Uh, that um, I think has not had great uptake. It, it, it does, in most people with increased abdominal fat and HIV, lead to a modest reduction in fat. The problem is once you stop it, the fat rebounds pretty quickly. Uh, so there's no sustained benefit from using it. And the problem is we don't have long-term safety data uh, on its use. Uh, so, uh, but there are data, interestingly, just in general, not focusing specifically on people with fatty liver disease, but in, in the studies that were done uh, that leading to its approval for uh, increased abdominal fat, they did show that um, liver fat uh, and, and liver enzymes uh, in, improved in people receiving this drug. So it is under study by uh, Colleen Hadigan at the NIH and Steve Grinspoon's group in Boston for NAFLD in people with HIV. Another interesting drug, and didn't give this as an option, and it's investigational, but is Sinicraviroc, which is a drug that was initially in development for HIV because it's a CCR5 antagonist like Maraviroc, uh, but has not moved forward for an HIV indication. It is actually being studied for NASH now. And it because it also, it's a, a dual antagonist, it also inhibits something called CCR2, which is a, a chemokine and is pro-inflammatory. 
and it's been studied for NASH. The phase two study, uh, interestingly, called the Centaur study, showed uh, improvement in fibrosis, but the primary endpoint of the study was actually not improvement in fibrosis. It was a two-point or greater decrease in the uh, NASH activity score, which is uh, focusing on the, the necrol inflammation. Uh, and in fact, did not reach that primary endpoint. But it's still moving forward. It, it seemed to have anti-fibrotic effects and uh, sort of an intriguing drug, and potentially you know, intriguing in HIV because of its potential anti-HIV activity as well. So I anticipate we'll be seeing studies of that in people with HIV and fatty liver disease in the near future. OK, so leading cause of death in someone with NASH in the general population, we don't have these data in HIV yet, is which of the following, hepatocellular carcinoma, other types of malignancies, cirrhosis or end-stage liver disease complications, or cardiovascular disease? OK, great. So. Um, most of you going with cardiovascular disease, which I think is, you know, I think we don't really know for sure, but I, I would probably pick that as the best answer. Uh, we certainly worry about end-stage liver disease. There's some limited data suggesting that um, other types of cancer may be more common in people in the general population with NASH. And uh, we do worry about hepatoma, though, fortunately, it's, it's uh, uncommon. So these are just some data from the general population, some population-based uh, data from Scandinavia showing in the upper left that uh, death rates in people with uh, NAFLD in general greater than uh, population-based controls. And if we split that out into NASH or just simple steatosis, it's really driven by the people with NASH. So greater uh, mortality rates in the general population uh, than, uh, uh, and driven by NASH. In terms of specific causes in this study, the most common cause was, in fact, cardiovascular disease with about double the rates compared to controls, uh, although liver-related death also uh, more common uh, uh, than controls, but less common than cardiovascular disease. So we do need to worry about cardiovascular disease risk in someone with fatty liver disease. And uh, with that in mind, um, we attained a fasting lipid profile in this patient, uh, shown here, total cholesterol of 234, LDL cholesterol of 156, HDL cholesterol is quite low at 25 milligrams per deciliter. Triglycerides elevated somewhat at 267. So consistent that the, the high triglycerides, low HDL, consistent with metabolic syndrome in addition to his known insulin resistance, uh, increased abdominal girth that are described by physical exam. So this patient uh, has metabolic syndrome. And um, we can also calculate a non-HDL cholesterol, which is simply total cholesterol minus HDL. Uh, that is sometimes thought of as a sort of a secondary target after LDL cholesterol, and it really encompasses all the atherogenic lipoproteins. And if you have an LDL, we'll talk about LDL goals in a moment. If you have one in mind, the non-HDL goal is usually the LDL goal plus 30. And uh, in terms of other major risk factors for heart disease, this patient did not have uh, a family history of premature heart disease. He's, as we talked about, not a smoker, does not have hypertension, and he's not diabetic, though I say yes, yet, because he certainly is pre-diabetic, and we do worry about his risk of developing diabetes over time. So um, I imagine many of us uh, in the room use um, some form of risk stratification for people once we get a lipid panel, particularly if it's abnormal. And uh, this is uh, the online version, or you can use it, do it on your smartphone, uh, of the 2013 AHA ACC risk calculator or pooled cohort equations. We can input data from our patient into this, uh, which I've done here. So we put in his, his age, uh, total cholesterol, uh, uh, his sex, HDL cholesterol level, the fact he doesn't have diabetes and is not on treatment for hypertension, uh, and uh, uh, his systolic blood pressure. And when we do that, we come up with a number of 10.8% risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease over the next 10 years, so roughly 1% per year risk of heart attack, stroke, need for revascularization, uh, or sudden cardiac death, and a lifetime risk of around 50%. So uh, you know, what do we do with this information? Uh, so given his lipid profile, just to remind you again, LDL of 156, low HDL, high triglycerides, what would you do at this point? In addition to, whoops, discussing uh, diet and exercise. So hopefully the choices will come back up. I'm getting the one minute sign from the back. Okay, great. 
So would you repeat his lipid panel in a year, change the TDF of Favrin to something else, start a statin, change those antiretrovirals and start a statin, or something else? Okay, so the majority going with starting a statin, and many actually going with changing the um, uh, antiretroviral regimen and starting a statin. So I think those are both great choices. Amazingly, nobody just decided to sit on his abnormal lipids, which is great, and um, a few of you going with something else, which is always a good option. So if we um, you know, kind of continue through this AHA-ACC algorithm, uh, this patient is considered to be at moderate to high, you know, considered to be at significant risk of heart disease, and the recommendation would be to initiate moderate to high intensity statin therapy. So you might ask, well, this, you know, these data that inform these, this uh, risk calculator from the general population, how does it apply to people with HIV? And a lot of people have studied, at this, uh, studied this in recent years. Uh, mostly you know, at presentations at CROI and the like, uh, a few published papers. And there is a suggestion that perhaps this risk calculator underestimates the risk of cardiovascular disease in people with HIV, particularly if they look at things like CT angiography and look at uh, a plaque, particularly non-calcified plaque, which seems to be more vulnerable to rupturing and causing heart attacks. Uh, so maybe a little bit of a dissociation, but we don't have a well-validated HIV-specific tool. DAD has a risk calculator that incorporates some HIV-related information, but it's not been validated, to my knowledge, outside of DAD. So I, I, I don't use that in my clinical practice. I really rely on this and then um, you know, think about it you know, even more so in someone with HIV, thinking that it might be a little bit um, uh, under-predicting risk. So, uh, as I alluded to, the, these guidelines actually don't have an LDL cholesterol goal anymore, and they, the recommendation is really to initiate either a high-intensity or moderate-intensity statin. And it's sort of a given in the, the general cardiology literature that you will get significant LDL reduction and you know, more so with a high-intensity statin. So these are the, the in the high-intensity category is a torvastatin at 40 to 80 milligrams or suvastatin at 20 to 40, and then lower doses and other statins in the moderate uh, intensity uh, statin category. Of course, we have to think of drug-drug interactions. This patient is actually on a Favrins, which will we know lowers pravastatin, simvastatin, uh, and uh, atorvastatin exposure. We don't, I don't think, have data necessarily on all the statins. Patavastatin is the newest statin; doesn't seem to interact significantly with any of the antiretrovirals that have been studied. Um, uh, but if you are on a, a boosted protease inhibitor or cobacistat, then you really would need to be thinking about using lower doses of statins because of uh, increased exposure to them. Again, pitavastatin being an exception. Uh, I think a, another set of guidelines that people are probably less aware of are from the National Lipid Association. The interesting thing about these guidelines is they included some HIV experts and preventive cardiologists with an interest in HIV on their panel. And um, this is sort of a busy slide, but essentially it mimics the older approach that we used to use before the newer AHA ACC guidelines, where we um, kind of stratify people based on their number of risk factors. And uh, our patient has uh, you know, age as a male over 45, HDL less than 40, or two major risk factors. We did the risk calculation, which was above 10%, so many would consider that, or some even 7.5% as a cutoff, uh, would be um, you know, a quantitative risk score reaching the high risk threshold. But you could also, they say, consider HIV as a major risk factor. It's not a strong recommendation. It's something that some people have thought of over the years, and these act they actually come out and say that, unlike the other guidelines. So if we do that, so he has three or four major risk factors, he is in a high risk state. They do include these LDL goals, and what's shown here is his LDL goal will be less than 100, his non-HDL goal, again, plus 30, so less than 130 and then considered drug therapy at uh, cutoffs of 100 and 130, respectively. Again, he was 156 and 209. So I think uh, you know, all, almost everyone opted with a statin with or without changing the antiretroviral regimen. So in terms of uh, switch data, I'm only going to show you one study. There have been large numbers of studies over the years, but um, this one is, I think, pertinent to this patient in that uh, it's looking at people on efavirenz. It was not a study specifically focusing on people with lipid abnormalities. It was just looking at, in a double-blinded, you know, randomized crossover fashion, 
uh, in people on efavirenz, what happened to symptoms that they might have, let's say abnormal dreams, uh, and what happened to some of their laboratory parameters, including lipids. So they um, were all on efavirenz to begin with. They were randomized to either stay on it or switch to raltegravir and then cross over to what they were, uh, you know, didn't do in the first part of the study. So if we look overall, while people were on raltegravir, they had improvements of their lipids. So total cholesterol, triglycerides, LDL cholesterol all went down. And perhaps not surprising, we know that the non-nukes in general inc lead to increases in HDL cholesterol. We don't know for sure that this is cardioprotective, but HDL definitely goes up in most people on non-nukes. So take away the non-nuke, the HDL actually went down. So the net effect may not have been uh, you know, it's sort of a, a mix of, of improving some of the bad lipids and decreasing the, you know, the protective HDL, so maybe a, a kind of a wash in the end. Um, so it would be something to think about. I talked about the, you know, the NASH data in 40 patients or NAFLD data in 40 patients, so there might be other reasons to switch off of efavirenz, um, but uh, I think starting a statin alone would also be a, a great option. So I'm not going to dwell on this because you've seen this uh, at least once already in this conference, the data on uh, emerging data uh, of a signal for increased risk of MI with use of darunavir ritonavir from the DAD study as opposed to atazanavir ritonavir, which intriguingly there's some data emerging has the potential to be cardioprotective, at least based on progression of carotid intima media thickness, which is a surrogate marker of atherosclerosis in the, in the heart. Uh, and some people think it may be the indirect hyperbilirubinemia, which may have some antioxidant effects. We know that people with Gilbert syndrome uh, who have indirect hyperbilirubinemia on occasion uh, tend to have less cardiovascular events. So it's sort of an intriguing thing that, again, maybe not ready for clinical practice, but something that we'll probably be seeing more data on in the future. And the back of your story, I'm also not going to dwell on because Mike Sag went over this in his case-based discussion. Uh, he showed us data from NA Accord that was sort of confirming the DAD data, which um, there have been several iterations of. There are also some data from Kaiser Permanente suggesting that a back of your use associated with increased risk of MI. And then Mike, I think, also showed these data. There have been two meta-analyses now, one by the FDA, another by a different group. In randomized controlled trials, they did not see this signal of an effect of abacavir. But I think we have to keep in mind, although it's stronger data in the sense that it's randomized, we don't have to worry about why people are being prescribed abacavir versus an alternative drug. Uh, the limitation of these studies are that they're relatively short follow-up and not specifically designed to look at cardiovascular events. So I'd say we don't really know for sure, um, but I personally tend to avoid a back of ear in, in high-risk patients. So um, just a reminder to many of you, the REPRIEVE study is a, a very large cardiovascular prevention study being done in people with HIV. Uh, it's a 6,500 patient NIH-funded study done at a large number of sites throughout the country, throughout the world. It's about two-thirds or more enrolled already, and it's randomizing people who do not meet a traditional statin indication to patavastatin, chosen because of uh, no drug-drug interactions with antiretrovirals, to our knowledge, versus uh, placebo, and it's following them for cardiovascular events. So the study is ongoing. The follow-up will be approximately six years unless stopped early, and uh, we eagerly await the results of these studies. And the rationale really is that statins have anti-inflammatory effects, effects on stabilizing atherosclerotic plaque in addition to their lipid-lowering properties. We will call it the pleiotropic effects of statins. So this will uh, see whether we should be using statins more uh, aggressively, more routinely in people with HIV, even if they have relatively normal lipids. Okay, so moving on uh, to some other screening things we might be thinking about. Which of the following uh, would you ideally recommend, recommend doing if you have access to them and, and, and funding is not an issue in this sexually active 54-year-old man who has sex with men and is at significant risk of coronary heart disease? An anal pap smear, a DEXA scan for bone mineral density, an anal pap and a DEXA scan, uh, an exercise stress test, or all of the above. OK, so a plurality going with uh, all of the above. Uh, and uh, sort of a mix of other responses, the next most popular being anal pap plus DEXA. So um, all of the above includes exercise stress tests. So interestingly, the majority of people would do an exercise stress test in this asymptomatic man at significant risk of heart disease. So I don't think there are any guidelines, we don't have 
you know, much in the way of HIV specific guidelines, but I think in the general population, uh, many people would not recommend doing that um, for somebody who is asymptomatic. If you're worried they have some symptoms that are not completely clear, uh, whether they're related to um, uh, atherosclerotic heart disease, I think it would be reasonable to do a stress test and try to see what's going on. Uh, but I don't think in someone who is otherwise asymptomatic uh, that uh, I personally would recommend a stress test. But I think these other tests would be appropriate to do. So let's talk about a few of these things. Um, so a word about um, HPV infection and kind of the natural history. A lot of this is based on cervical cancer. And I know we have some, some experts in the room uh, who think a lot about these things. Uh, uh, this slide is courtesy of my colleague Tim Wilkin, who's really an expert in this area and knows uh, infinitely more than I do. But the course uh, is thought to be you know, initial HPV infection and then um, progression in some people to uh, low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesions. And then they may you know, potentially clear the infection or progress to high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesions, we call HISIL, and then a small proportion of these people could progress to anal cancer. So in people with HIV, we worry potentially about increased exposure to HPV, less clearance because of impaired cell-mediated immunity, and potentially greater rates of progression persistence of infection and progression across this spectrum. And we know that rates of invasive anal cancer are higher in people with HIV. So the question is, what you know, can we do something to prevent this? So um, many centers uh, do have active anal cancer uh, screening programs, uh, with the first step being uh, screening with uh, an anal pap smear, so shown on the lower left. We have uh, an abnormal appearing cell here. Uh, then the patient may go on to high resolution anoscopy if they have an abnormal pap. And then if there's a, whoops, sorry. Uh, an abnormal uh, area here that uh, stains, uh, then they would have biopsy and potentially ablation uh, with something like infrared coagulation. So the, the goal really is to try to get rid of these high-grade lesions that have the potential to turn into anal cancer. Of course, if anal cancer itself is diagnosed by any of these modalities, then the appropriate treatment would be combined chemotherapy and radiation. So just to get a sense of what you guys are doing in the room, um, do you routinely do anal pap smears in your practice, yes or no? Okay, so almost a 50-50 split. And then uh, I think the, the next question will sort of re relates to this. Uh, do you have the ability to refer patients readily for high resolution anoscopy? Okay, so 60% yes, 37% uh, no, and a, f a few people not sure. Uh, so I think that's you know, generally the bottleneck and probably the reason why you know, roughly half of you don't have active uh, anal pap smear you know, uh, uh, screening in your practices is because if you find something abnormal, unless it's actually cancer, which would be very rare, uh, if it's abnormal, then you really should move to the next step, which is high resolution anoscopy. And if you can't you know, refer somebody for that, don't have the ability to get it done, then you're kind of stuck with just having this abnormal screening test and not really knowing what to do with it. So this is a controversial area. And um, I think there's general acceptance uh, based on the literature that anal high cell, high grade dysplastic lesions, uh, are precursors of anal cancer. But high cell is quite prevalent, particularly in people with HIV, and uh, most people with anal high cell will not develop cancer. So it's the type of thing, you know, we don't have cost effectiveness data to really, uh, uh, you know, really strongly inform what to do. We don't have guidelines that uh, necessarily tell us what to do. New York State has some guidelines. I don't know about other areas of the country per se, but there's no national guidelines uh, to, to advocate this strongly. And um, we, it, there's a feeling in, and in some literature that treatment of anal high cell uh, is not as effective as treatment of cervical high cell and that there are uh, greater recurrence rates and, and a greater need for multiple treatments. Um, as we talked about, accessing HRA uh, can be an issue and treatment is difficult, uncomfortable for patients. They generally don't like it. It can be painful. They can have bleeding. Um, 
And we don't really have any data that uh, treating these precursors uh, will actually prevent the development of anal cancer. So that's where this trial comes in, the ANCHOR trial. It's kind of the reprieve equivalent for, for anal cancer. Uh, it's sponsored also by the NIH, and uh, they expect to screen over 17,000 patients to enroll a little over 5,000. It's men and women aged 35 and older who have high cell based on uh, a, a, a biopsy, HRA and a biopsy. And then they're randomized to either just monitoring, so every six-month digital rectal exams and high-resolution anoscopy, biopsy if needed, uh, versus intervention, meaning uh, these high-grade lesions are actually treated by whatever modality the clinician feels is appropriate. So often infrared coagulations, there are other things that can be done, uh, even topical 5-FU uh, is sometimes used if there are extensive lesions. And then they're being followed for the development of anal cancer. So the good thing is they have to enroll, they have to enroll over 5,000 people because anal cancer is rare. It's more common in HIV, but it's still rare. So they expect to see actually less than 50 uh, occurring of anal cancer among these 5,000 plus patients. And uh, the goal is to see whether the active intervention of treating these high-grade lesions will reduce the incidence of anal cancer. So if you're uh, anywhere near uh, the places uh, depicted on this slide, I hope you'll uh, think about referring people for the study. So mo I think the study sites in general can do the screening, you know, f you know even starting with a pap smear uh, and potentially enroll people into the study. So we've been uh, very busy uh, at our site under Tim Wilkins' direction uh, enrolling people into this trial. So this uh, particular patient of my colleagues did have an anal pap. It was uh, satisfactory for evaluation based on the cytopathologist. And it came back as uh, ASCUS, atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance. So the, the simple rule that I learned from my colleague, Tim Wilkin, which took me a while to learn, even though it is simple, is anything other than normal, I should refer for high-resolution anoscopy. So I used to go to him and say, this is you know, ASCUS or low cell, what should I do? Really, anything other than normal, uh, should be referred for anoscopy because really what you see in the PAPs are may not correlate uh, that well with what they see with high resolution anoscopy. So you can have ASCUS and then they do HRA and biopsy and they show uh, high cell. So uh, really, um, that's sort of the goal is to, to detect these lesions. And this particular patient um, had an abnormal staining uh, area by uh, acido. Uh, so essentially it's acetic acid or vinegar uh, staining in this area that uh, looked abnormal. Uh, it was biopsied and in fact came back normal and the recommendation for my colleagues was to do another PAP in a year. So let's talk a little bit about screening for bone mineral density. Jeannie Siegler touched on this briefly in her uh, aging talk. Uh, DEXA measurement, dual X-ray absorptiometry, a simple nuclear medicine test. It's usually around a couple hundred dollars at the most in most, setting, in most sites. Um, measures uh, bone mineral density, and it's the, the kind of the clinical standard. Uh, it measures it generally at three anatomic sites, a lumbar spine, uh, the femoral neck, and total proximal femur. And the International Society for Clinical Densitometry says to use the lowest T-score, which I'll define in a moment, uh, from, from any of these sites. So uh, our patient had this done, and I've highlighted his lowest value. We're going to talk about Z-scores in a little bit, but for now we'll focus on T-scores. This is starting out at the spine. His the lowest value in the negative direction was 1.6. And in fact, uh, in his femur, uh, also minus 1.6. So based on this T-score of minus 1.6 in this 54-year-old man, uh, how do we interpret this? Is this normal bone density for his age, osteopenia or low bone density, osteoporosis, or we need more information, or, or you don't know? Okay, so maybe too easy in a question. 81% uh, going with the correct answer, low bone density, and then sort of a smattering of other answers. So let's talk about Z and T, and T scores. I'm going to start out with a Z score. And uh, if there's pediatricians or family practitioners, you're probably familiar with this in terms of some uh, monitoring growth. So we first to how many standard deviations an observation is from the mean of the distribution. And it's normalized to a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So I apologize for those. Uh, who are sort of math phobic um, for this, but uh, we can just think of it as here's the mean, how many standard deviations is our value from this mean? And so it's multiples of standard deviations. So this is about 1.5 in the positive direction. Our patient was 1.6 in the negative direction for their T-score, which I'll talk about in a moment, but it's a similar concept. 
So uh, z-score, again, is uh, what we just said. A t-score is really not comparing, it's comparing to specifically uh, what's uh, considered to be the, the someone uh, who's not the same age, but somebody who is a young adult who's achieved peak bone mass, which generally occurs around uh, age 25 to 30. So just looking at it graphically here, peak bone mass is this thick blue line at the top here. This red line is the natural progression that we all go through with aging. And um, this example is not, not our patient's value, but this star indicates the person's uh, bone density value and standard deviations. Uh, and then we can look at it by comparing it to peak bone mass is the T-score. And if we compare it to somebody their own age is the Z-score. So we have two different values. So here the Z-score is minus 1.5, the T-score is minus three. So you know, why do we have both of these? It really relates to uh, the, you know, the WHO definitions. So for a man age 50 and older, like our patient, or postmenopausal women, uh, we should be using T-scores, and we don't have to really worry about the Z-score, although I find it encouraging just to tell patients that sometimes that you, know, you, you may have osteopenia, but compared to some of your own age, it's actually pretty common. And so I do um, often use that when talking to patients. But, um, uh, and th these are the definitions, which it sounds like many of you are familiar with. Uh, osteoporosis being less than or equal to minus 2.5, so 2.5 in the negative direction. Minus 1 to minus 2.5 is uh, low bone mass or osteopenia, and then minus 1 and above would be considered normal. Severe osteoporosis is sometimes defined as minus uh, 2.5, uh, uh, less than minus 2.5 with a history of fracture. But if you have a man under age 50 or a premenopausal woman, then uh, we're not supposed to use the T score, we're supposed to actually use the Z score, um, or Z score for you, Sue. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, it's considered below the expected range for age if it's less than minus two. So that's where the, the Z score comes into play. So uh, just uh, in terms of recommendations for evaluating and potentially managing bone disease, I, I'm not going to get into this in a lot of detail. This is from a, a great review article by Todd Brown. It's actually sort of pseudo-guidelines. It's sort of not sanctioned by any organization, but it uh, is a group of experts in bone disease and HIV throughout the world who got together. Um, it may have been drug company funded, I don't recall, but uh, at any rate, they came up with some set of consensus recommendations. So I think it's a, um, a good good review at any rate, and uh, I don't know we have to rigidly adhere to what they say, but uh, their approach is to really assess the risk of uh, what's called fragility fracture in all adults. So fragility fracture is a, an abnormal pathologic fracture, and it's sort of having a fracture with the equivalent of falling from a standing height. So if I were to topple over and break a hip, that's obviously not normal. It would be indicative of having um, abnormal bone, significantly abnormal bone mineral density. And uh, they, so they recommend uh, obtaining a DEXA if someone has major risk factor for fragility fracture, which would include a prior fragility fracture, uh, significant glucocorticoid exposure defined as uh, more than three months of the equivalent of five milligrams or more of prednisone exposure, uh, or being at high risk of falling. And some of the things that, that Jeannie talked about uh, the other day would, you know, would be uh, relevant here. If they don't have a major risk factor, they recommend for men between 40 and 49 and postmenopausal women, uh, uh, premenopausal women, I'm sorry, uh, 40 and older, to calculate the 10 year fracture risk uh, using the fracture risk assessment tool or FRAC score that uh, Jeannie uh, reviewed and I'm going to go over as well. Um, and then to obtain a DEXA scan in postmenopausal women, men 50 and older, if they have a major risk factor, as we covered already, or a greater than 10% risk of a major osteoporotic fracture by uh, this FRAX assessment. So um, I think Jeannie showed a similar slide. This is uh, the FRAX website here. I should say, you will, you, I think you can access my slides now because of the, the questions, but you will be able to get them uh, at the end of the talk. Um, so we plug in the patient's information here, and we come up with a, a score here that you probably can't read of a major uh, risk of major osteoporotic fracture uh, over 10 years of 3.7%, hip fracture 0.2%. So it's actually low risk. But I didn't do what Jeannie recommended, uh, which was to check the box for secondary osteoporosis. And if we do that, so this number is 3.7 now, it goes to 5.0. So it goes up modestly, and we'll talk about some data that suggests that we should be doing that, as Jeannie recommended. We can also, if we have a DEXA scan, input that information and kind of fine tune our estimate a little bit more. You can put in either a T-score or the actual BMD measurement, which was on that, the slides that I showed you of the patient's DEXA data. 
And uh, if we do that, it actually goes from five to like 4.6. So it just tweaks it a little bit. It's, you know, it's less than 10%, so it's not considered high risk. So what about you know, checking this box for secondary osteoporosis? Uh, these are data from Mike Yin from Columbia, who did a study uh, uh, in men from the VA system, where he looked at around 17,000 men without HIV infection and about 7,000 men with HIV infection. And he simply looked at the expected risk of fracture based on the FRAX calculator and the observed risk. And if they were the, uh, equal, then you would expect it to fall on this line of unity here. And as you can hopefully appreciate, a lot of these, uh, for the people without HIV, they're falling a little bit to the left of the line, meaning that the, what they actually saw was a little bit higher rates of fracture than predicted. And we, we calculated the observed to expected ratio, so it would be one if they were the same. It was about 1.3, so about 30% higher rates than uh, expected based on FRAX. When they looked at HIV infected, however, this ratio went up to about 1.6 or 60% higher risk uh, or event rates than predicted. And we see more of these uh, dots here falling to the left of the line. And then when he click the secondary osteoporosis box on the FRAX calculator, we see that these shift a little to the right. The ratio actually goes down to about 1.2. So I think these are data that um, uh, uh, tell me that I should be checking that box for secondary osteoporosis to get a better estimate of the risk of fracture. And then Jeannie showed you the slide already. There are these complicated algorithms for managing bone disease that I don't have time to get into today. I just refer you to either uh, this Brown article or this other uh, review article um, in uh, Expert Review of Anti-Infective Therapy that also uh, goes over a potential approach to managing these conditions. So uh, in the last uh, minute or so, uh, if this patient who's 54 reported smoking a pack a day since age 20 for 34 pack years, would you screen for lung cancer? And if so, how? Low dose, chest CT, chest x-ray, sputum cytology, or you wouldn't screen? Go ahead and show the answers. Uh, it looked like about 63% uh, going with 60% uh, going with low dose chest CT, and then a few going with chest X-ray, and about 20% no. So there aren't HIV-specific guidelines. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force does recommend screening. So this is not intended to be a trick question. The patient really is 54. The guidelines say 55 to 80. Um, whether we should do it at a lower age in HIV, I think, remains to be seen. But 30 pack year or more smoking history and either still smoking or having quit within the past 15 years. There are some data from France on screening. I'm not going to, since I'm over time, I'm not going to get into the data. Just suffice it to say they did detect some early lung cancers in the screening program using a little bit different criteria uh, than uh, the US guidelines for the general population. And interesting, they found um, fractures in the uh, spine in 11% of people, and their average age was about 50. So to me, it suggests we should be measuring height in patients routinely just to make sure that we're not seeing shrinkage due to vertebral fractures, not some Something we're good at doing in our clinic at least. And then just to say that there are some data that the risk of lung cancer is elevated in people with HIV uh, compared to the general population, low CD4 to CD8 ratio associated, and survival may be poor uh, with HIV infected people with lung cancer compared to the general population. So I apologize for going over, but my take home messages for you are that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, should be in the differential diagnosis of transaminase elevations. There are data suggesting that NASH is more prevalent in HIV than the general population. We should be thinking about cardiovascular risk in these patients. Anal cancer screening uh, strategy and, and statin use are under study in these large clinical endpoint studies. So we look forward to seeing those data in the coming years. We should be thinking about fracture risk and doing DEXA scans uh, in um, men over 50 and older, uh, postmenopausal women, and those at high risk of fracture. And to think about low dose CT scanning, CT scanning uh, in our uh, patients as they're aging if they have significant smoking histories. I think we're not that great about doing it in our clinic, and uh, uh, particularly as our patients are getting older and these HIV related risk factors, we should be thinking about this more. So thanks for your attention.
Great, Marshall. Uh, it's tough to cover all that material, and you did a great job with it. Um, once you start screening, by the way, if, let's say we do this low-dose uh, CT, how often do you do it? Do it once, and then what? Yeah, I think when you well, feel like doing it again. Yeah, I think you know if it's completely normal, then I think you can space it out a little more. Yeah. Uh, you know, the problem is a lot of people will have these nodules. We're seeing it actually in this reprieve study where we're participating in a cardiovascular sub-study with CT angiography, and like half of our patients have these little nodules, and they have to have a repeat CT in, in six months or a year. So the nodules are very common, and, and usually the radiologist will give you recommendations about when to repeat uh, the follow-up. I practice here in San Antonio where we do not have access to FibroScan, let alone the fancy new version of FibroScan. But it has been proposed that FIB4 can be a surrogate. What are your thoughts on FIB4? Yeah, great question uh, about FIB4 for uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Certainly in, in hepatitis C, I think there's pretty good data, and it was really derived uh, in that setting. I, it's probably a reasonable thing to calculate. I mean, the parameters that go into it, including like the platelet count and uh, et cetera, are things that you know, we would expect to change in advanced liver disease. So whether it's any better than just sort of looking at the patient's basic labs, I'm not sure. But uh, if you don't have access to other modalities, it's probably a reasonable thing to do. But I I'm actually don't know the data very well about validation of that in, in HIV and NAFLD. It's a great question. Kristen. Yes, thank you for a fantastic talk. Um, so Ryan White uh, programs uh, devote a certain amount of uh, time and energy to reporting on the HIV-AIDS performance measures. And one of the uh, impressions I have from this conference is how far we have moved in terms of what we consider to be standards of care from those performance measures. So uh, checking a hep C antibody is really no longer sufficient. We now should be, should, we should be curing. Um, and the recommendations for uh, PCP prophylaxis are now, are now updated. And you've pre presented a lot of other fantastic sort of uh, clinical quality measures for us to be thinking about. So just as a, a comment maybe for your reflection or Dr. Cheever's reflection, could we be uh, moving those performance measures and tools uh, to assess them to really better um, address the clinical needs of our patients? Yeah, thank you very much for that, that point, Kristen. Sue. Thank you, Marshall. Great talk. Um, I almost can't bear to ask this question about the Abacavir thing, but it will not go away somehow. And so I think it was helpful when you said you tried to avoid it in uh, people with a cardiovascular risk. But my question to you is, do you actually take people off it? And maybe, Mike, you can respond to this, mm -hmm. too. I mean, if you have someone that you, you know, over time has become more at risk for a cardiovascular event, will you go to the time and trouble of taking them off a of back of it. Do you think it's that compelling? Yeah, so I think we touched on it a bit in one of Mike's cases uh, on day one. Uh, and my, personally, I uh, it would probably take somebody off of a back of ear if they have another good option. And you know, now that we have TAF, uh, you know, back before we had that, it was often more complicated. They had a little uh, chronic kidney disease. But with TAF, I, and you know, assuming there's no resistance uh, concerns, I think many people probably can switch from a back of ear to TAF, and I would do that in somebody with high risk. Now, do we have data on TAF and cardiovascular risk? You know, there are concerns you know, that, um, at least going from TDF to TAF, there, in clinical trials, there's very slight increases in, in lipids. But in the real world, I've anecdotally had colleagues show me like these massive you know, changes in lipid profiles. I don't know if you're nodding, so maybe people do sometimes see some outliers, just like we see you know, in, in many situations. So uh, the, the short answer, well, it's not such a short answer, I guess, but my answer is yes, I probably would switch, strongly consider switching them off of the back of ear if they are at significant cardiovascular risk. There probably is increased risk even if they're at low risk, but the absolute risk is so much lower that it's probably um, less important. Okay. One of the questions was, are the slides available? And the answer is yes, after the talk, it'll be online with the rest of them. Um, so this uh, HOMA IR calculation, does it tell you more than just an elevated uh, A1C? Yeah, so uh, great question. So the, the, the A1C is a little bit controversial in terms of screening for diabetes in people with HIV. And you know, the patient that I showed you may very well have a normal A1C or maybe could be um, you know, in the pre-diabetes range. Uh, I didn't, sh I don't actually know if the patient had one. I didn't, when I was reviewing the chart, didn't um, focus on that. But 
Uh, there are some concerns that A1C may underestimate glucose, uh, ambient glucose exposure, if you will, in people with HIV. There have been uh, several studies of it. We did one in the, the WISE cohort, this women's uh, interagency HIV study, where we had very modest underprediction of, of uh, fasting glucose value. Uh, Colleen Hadigan at the NIH did a very nice study, um, kind of cross-sectional, uh, but prospective, uh, looking at several, like a, a fasting glucose and a postprandial glucose and an A1C, and found that the A1C significantly underpredicted glucose levels in people with HIV compared to people without HIV. Um, and some of the associations have been with a back of your use, for unclear reasons, um, elevated MCV, a mean corpuscular volume, and the, hemat you know, the uh, CBC. Again, not really clear why, unless it has something to do with red blood cell survival. So um, I think in somebody where you're concerned, let's say, about metabolic syndrome or, or fatty liver disease, that there probably is added value to doing the HOMA IR uh, as opposed to just relying on an A1C, sensitivity-wise. A couple of DEXA questions. Um, if, if DEXA is not available and you're looking at the FRAX index and it goes red, is that sufficient to trigger treatment for osteoporosis? That's a, a really good question. Um, yeah, I, I sort of, I guess, thought that DEXA was pretty widely available, but I suppose if you're really stuck and someone is at significantly high risk, uh, you know, maybe that would be something that you would be thinking about treating for osteoporosis absent that information. And I guess similarly, um, if someone is on TDF and they're starting to show those uh, leanings, would you just switch them over to TAF and help? Yeah, sort of like I mean, we, we have good data that's, you know, there's a, a modest, um, improvement in most people switching from TDF to TAF. Uh, and as we sort of talked about, I think with the cases the other day, you know, it would be something to factor into your decision about which drug to use if someone is sort of at the age range or, you know, postmenopausal women, uh, to think about using that rather than TDF. Somebody has NASH, you're trying diet, exercise, and it ain't working so well. Uh, would you refer that person that they had significant obesity for surgery, bypass, that type of thing? Yeah, great question. Now, I think if somebody is, you know, morbidly obese and would qualify for bariatric surgery, I think we would expect that to improve liver fat. We, you know, do we have data in HIV? No. It's really very limited data on bariatric surgery in general in HIV. Uh, there's some, some limited uh, I think case series, but I think it would be, uh, you know, a, uh, something to think about. Okay. What about uh, any guidance for, formal guidance for anti-inflammatory drugs? Uh, in treating uh, DVT or uh, other tendencies in HIV? So in other words, if they get uh, avascular necrosis, that type of thing, is there anything you would recommend or is there any place you can go to get information? Yeah, well, um, so it's a pretty broad question. Um, one thing to think about, I guess, I didn't touch on is aspirin use and baby aspirin use. No. <clears throat> excuse me, no clear guidance in HIV. Some, uh, a nice study from uh, Mount Sinai in New York, uh, Judy Aberg, I think is a senior author, um, showing that aspirin actually doesn't seem to have uh, anything in the way of anti-inflammatory properties, looking at sort of traditional um, systemic markers of inflammation and immune activation in people with HIV. But I think, I would think about it just in a similar way to the general population. If someone is at, you know, moderate to increased risk of heart disease and no, uh, contraindication in terms of GI bleeding, et cetera, would be probably uh, strongly consider uh, low-dose aspirin. In terms of some of these other things, you know, uh, DVT, recurrent DVT can be a problem in HIV. I think the main thing to be thinking about uh, is uh, some of these no novel uh, oral anticoagulant drugs interact with antiretrovirals, so you should definitely look into that if you're thinking about using something other than heparin and warfarin. Um, in terms of anti-inflammatory use to prevent that, I, I'm not aware of any data. And right. osteonecrosis, or vascular necrosis, I think we don't completely understand the pathogenesis in HIV, and I don't know that there's necessarily any role for anti-inflammatory. So, so at the risk of getting too bogged down in biochemical details, but if you remember back to the arachidonic acid pathway, the piece, if you use things like uh, uh, Motrin or uh, ibuprofen or naproxen, it blocks the thromboxanes, which is what causes platelet aggregation, but also blocks uh, mediators of, of vasodilatation like prostacycline. So aspirin in studies has been more effective than, say, naproxen because it's more selective on thromboxanes. So it's just something to keep in mind that 
a lot of people will use naproxen or ibuprofen as a way to prevent cardiovascular risk, and in study after study, it really isn't sufficient. And then the question is, if you add aspirin to naproxen, does that help? And I don't know the answer to that. Probably helps with bleeding. But, yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right, switching subjects to the anal pap. So how about using anal paps in women? Yeah, definitely. So um, women who have cervical dysplasia are very high risk of having anal dysplasia. And uh, we routinely screen women. We, we pretty much screen everybody now with anal paps from our clinic. It started out with MSM, women with cervical dysplasia and uh, on pap smear. And, um, people with anal genital warts, and it's sort of like really expanding to almost everybody because most people fit into one of those categories. Um, yeah. What about hepatotoxicity of statins? So you've got somebody who has an indication for it, but they've got NASH and other liver problems. What do you do? Yeah, I think the hepatotoxicity of statins is a little bit uh, overhyped. I think mm -hmm. there are pretty good data that people in the general population, that people with advanced liver disease, most people can tolerate a statin. Um, you know, there may be some you know, differences between statins, uh, even similar to, to the myalgias that is also kind of controversial. Some people do better in one statin versus another, but I think you can, you know, I would not use liver disease or fatty liver disease as a contraindication to starting a statin. Start it, you can monitor liver enzymes, but um, most people will do fine. Question microphone. For HIV positive women, are you still doing yearly PAPs or have you spaced them out at all? Uh, cervical or, or anal? Uh, cervical. Yeah, I, uh, that's a good question. I, I don't have any, uh, the, I have a very small number of women in my practice personally, and uh, they um, uh, are, they've had, I think, all had hysterectomies, believe it or not, but um, <laughs> uh, I don't know if Jean uh, is coming to them. Oh, I was hoping so, you'd come to the mic. So, yeah, the uh, guidelines have actually changed, and you can find, they are actually, the PAPs have been normal. Uh, you get, if you get PAP plus HPV, you can go every three years. The guidelines are actually listed in the um, HHS guidelines under opportunistic infections under HPV, which is why nobody can find them. But they're there. So we are spreading it out a little bit. That's Jean Keller from Johns Hopkins. Thank you. Um, and then I just, somebody just sent the answer up that the, said that uh, uh, if you're using non-steroidals and aspirin together in somebody with coronary artery disease, that, it, that the non-steroidals override the aspirin effects and they're sort of not supposed to be used together, ideally, um, for reasons I guess we just said. A um, couple of niche questions here. Um, somebody has familial hypercholesterolemia and they're young, is there a particular antiretroviral regimen you'd use uh, to try to minimize the cholesterol effect? Okay, great question. Uh, you know, we have quite a few antiretrovirals that are, I think, relatively neutral in terms of their effects, as far as we know. One of the challenges, you know, particularly if you take somebody with advanced HIV disease and put them probably on any regimen, um, particularly if they've lost, you know, they have some wasting perhaps, they're going to gain weight, you know, get healthier, and often we see increases in their, their lipids. And um, so it's sometimes hard to dissociate in studies, uh, particularly older studies when people were being initiating therapy at a lower CD4 count, what was this quote unquote return to health or maybe return to not so good health uh, versus direct effects of the drugs. But in you know, contemporary studies where people you know, are generally starting, you know, the average CD4 count is generally much higher than in the past. Most contemporary regimens don't have like, that bad effects on lipids. I think integrase inhibitors in general are quite neutral. Um, you know, TAF itself, I think, is probably neutral, uh, FTC neutral. So I think any regimen, and, and TDF has lipid-lowering properties that we don't understand. So probably any integrase inhibitor-based regimen would be fine if you're worried about cardiovascular risk and you're going to avoid a back of your. So we're a minute over or so, but we have two questions. I'd love just to say we finish the question. So real quick, uh, if there's a discrepancy between DEXA and FRAX, what do you do? Treat. Uh, In other words... Well, I can go into more detail, but basically the FRAC scores shows one thing and the, the T-scores are less than three, and um, should you treat them? And I guess the answer is yeah, I mean, I think sure. They, yeah, and I think they're not sure in what scenarios they would be discordant, but... Right. Yeah. And then finally, what ICD code do you use to get a DEXA scan? You have that memorized? <laughs> <laughs> I would uh, Google it. We'll look that up. Okay, great, Marshall. Thank you very much.
All right, so uh, we're about ready to wrap this up. We have the workshops that go um, uh, at uh, about 10 minutes from now. And so make your way over to the upstairs and you got the listings there. Please make sure you fill out your evaluations. Dr. Cheever, yeah, please stay seated for Dr. Cheever wants to make a few comments. Can we have the music, please? Yeah. Well, we can't. I just wanted everybody to be emblazoned in your mind that when you, yes, when you fill out your forms on your surveys, think this music and that'll help you remember the lectures. It's, it's really good for you. And, and when you see the masters next year, you'll also think of this conference. I just want to say that. thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, first, I do want to thank you all for coming here. I know that you do need to take time out of really busy practices and carve it out. Um, I don't know if any month is convenient. I'm, I'm sure that August is not. Um, so a few things. First, to thank the IAS USA staff for their tremendous work. They really make this happen flawlessly. Um, and, and also to thank uh, our co-chairs for coming and, and doing so much work. We do spend a lot of time kind of curating individual presentations, making sure we don't have overlap and that sort of thing. And I was completely on vacation for that, so I did none of it this year. But it all looks great. So thanks, everyone else, for working in my absence. And finally, to let you all know that we do, in fact, uh, ha plan on having the clinical conference next year. We're, we're, we're planning on having a full Ryan White uh, all, all recipient meeting, all grantee meeting. I don't know the month yet. Um, it's going to be in Washington, D.C., and it's going to be whenever the hotels are the cheapest because that's the way we do it in the government. So in, probably in either you know, sometime in August or December, but I don't actually know. That's up to the contractor, and it's all being competed right now, so I don't know where we're going to end up, but that would be my guess based on previous experiences. So do stay tuned for that. Um, we are looking to have the clinical conference either around or concurrent with that meeting. Uh, we've done both ways in the past, and I don't know, once again, where we'll be this year. That'll depend on the contracting process. But please do uh, look for that. We uh, look forward to having uh, many of you return or other colleagues from that. So thank you all very much, and safe travels.